you're live. Uh, good evening. We are going to get started with our April 30th, 2020 school committee meeting. I'm Julie Schreiner Oldham. I'm the chair of the committee. With us right now from school committee, we also have Helen Charlevsky, Susan Wolf Dickoff, Suzanne Feverspiel, David Coleman, Michael Glover, Barbara Scotto, and Jennifer Monopoly. And uh, Sharon, uh, Sharon Abramowitz is going to be joining us later in the evening. We are going to have going to go ahead and get started. Well, we have our consent agenda, which includes past records of some of the school committee meetings and also a number of contract amendments on the Driscoll project and high school project. Is there anything that Susan or anyone else had wanted to say on those items or should we just go ahead and vote them? Or if there are any questions about any of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it might be an idea since uh, we do have Tony Quigley here and I think Ray Masek too, that they could just go over those those pieces. I know we'd like to get through them quickly, but just there are a number. Andy Felix is here too. Um, and uh, it, it, can somebody put them up on the screen? I don't know who, Ben? I'm not sure what you mean, Helen. I I can I can just describe them, Helen, if you'd like. Okay, that would be great. So Amendment 16 has to do with William Ron Associates. That involves two items. Uh, they redesigned the third floor after they were 90% complete, so we could get a million dollar uh, value out of that design. And then secondly, it's a soil classification that's required for uh, landfill. So that involves uh, William Ron Associates. Uh, next, we have two items for um, uh, Skanska. The first item involves uh, 40, around 40 uh, changes that occurred during enabling. Um, that has been looked at by William Ron Associates, Hill and myself. And we'd like to move forward with that. And the second is a, um, an allowance uh, for COVID, such as for cleaning the trailers and whatnot, uh, services that weren't anticipated by Skanska at the time. So that's just an allowance with no markup. Um, so that's William Ron. That's. Um, and then we have Skanska. one, two, three, four for Driscoll School. So. Is Tony there? Yes, I, I, I can uh, run through these. I can run through these if you wish. Just quickly. Okay, the first, actually there's, there's three for Jonathan Lefke architects, three contract amendments, and there's one for uh, left field. So I'll do the levy ones first. Uh, these have been presented and discussed at the building commission meeting and have been approved by them. And if there's favorable action tonight by the school committee, they'll go on, go on to the selectmen. Uh, excuse me, the select board, pardon me. So the uh, first is amendment number three to the contract with Lef uh, Jonathan Levy Associates in the amount of $123,173. And that's for the um, geothermal test well uh, at the site. What this is, is to uh, drill a test well and then uh, test the, uh, the, uh, the uh, subsurface conditions for thermal connectivity. And this will inform the design relative to the geothermal uh, system as a possible free approach to providing heating and, uh, and uh, air dehumidification uh, for the building. So that's what that's for. Uh, amendment number four uh, to the levy architect, bear with me please, is, uh, is in the amount of uh, $138,512. And this is to provide additional uh, geotechnical borings. If you recall, we did a whole bunch of borings recently on the site and uh, we, in one small location, we, uh, we hit um, uh, 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 oil or something like that. So uh, the idea is to determine how extensive that is so that we can build the proper 
uh, mitigation procedures into the construction contract. It's a standard procedure. So that's for $138,512. And then the final one for Jonathan Levy Architect is amendment number five, the amount of $340,725. And that's to provide um, geo, uh, environmental and geotechnical um, uh, design and construction administration through the end of the project based on what we know right now. So those are those three amendments. And then the one for left field is in the amount of $523, uh, 50, excuse me, $588.59. That's for reimbursable services, printing and advertising associated with the effort to bring um, the construction manager at risk company on board, which uh, we all know at this point is Gilbane and very excited about that. And the contract is pending. So those are the uh, things with regards to Driscoll School before the, uh, the school committee this evening. Okay, do we have any questions on those before we vote? All right, so we're gonna go ahead and... Um, then there's the last one, the temporary amendment to authorize signature policy. That one has to be voted on separately. Great, thank you. Uh, so, with, yep, so with respect to the consent agenda, uh, seeing no questions, we'll go through. Um, Ms. Charlevsky? Yes. Ms. Wolf Dickhoff? Ms. Federspiel? Mr. Perlman? Yes. And Mr. Glover? Yes. Ms. Scotto? Okay, I see you voting yes. Um, Ms. Monopoly? Yes. All right, and the chair votes yes as well, so that's unanimous. All right, and then uh, Mary Ellen, did you want to give us a brief explanation on this vote to allow temporary suspension of actual signatures? Um, we still need to execute uh, a number of different documents. And so uh, this request is to facilitate that uh, the documents that are actually sitting in the finance office at the moment, I sign with affirmative vote of the school committee on behalf of the school committee and then attach their uh, the minutes to that contract as so they can be submitted and sent along to the select board. Yeah. So, it doesn't change our warrant process. So in um, the warrants that typically Helen Charlepsky signs as the chair of the capital subcommittee, um, it doesn't change that process. Those are just the general bill payments, but any contract adjustment um, and has always come to the school committee for a vote and signature. So they all will come just to be clear. I'm sorry, um, mm -hmm. but Chair, can I ask yes. a question because we talked about this a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so all the capital ones would be your signature and mine, correct? The invoices, yes, the invoice. that's the same under and, the. And the contract amendments also. Uh, no, the contract amendments would still need to be voted by the school committee. Right, like and we just school, did. And we just did, yes. And the school committee can leave this motion that it's just my signature or it's the signature of the capital subcommittee chair or any other subcommittee chair that's appropriate to the item that was voted. I, the, I would like no. to suggest that we do have the subcommittee chair co-sign it. Okay. Be fine. Are you making, so do we want to make, are you making a motion, Helen? Is that how you want to make the motion? I think just to be on the safe side, we should have a second pair of eyes take a look at it. Okay, Mary Ellen, what language would we, so we would have, and we would authorize the Deputy Superintendent for Administration and Finance and the Chair of the appropriate subcommittee? Yep, that would be cool. All right, so um, we have a motion on a possible, so a motion to allow for the temporary suspension of actual signatures in accordance with the authorized signature policy and authorize the deputy superintendent for administration and finance and the appropriate subcommittee chair to, the sign, school uh, committee chair. to sign as designees for the school committee, all contracts that have been publicly voted and approved. Mm -hmm. And now if there are things that are 
publicly voted and approved though at full committee, that would fall then to the chair or the vice chair? Yeah, I said yeah. subcommittee. I probably shouldn't have. So I'll change that to say committee or subcommittee. All right, does anyone have any further questions? So that's the, Helen's made that motion. Do we have a second? Okay, Suzanne, thank you. So we have a second. Are there any further discussion? No, seeing none. All right, I'm gonna, gonna run down through the vote. So we have uh, Ms. Strelepsky. Yes. Ms. wolf Dickhoff. Ms. Fetterspiel. Yes. Mr. Perlman. Yes. Mr. Glover. Yes. Ms. Scotto. Yes. Ms. Monopoly. Yes. And the chair votes yes. That's unanimous. All right, thank you to all of the participants that we have who are here uh, to provide a presentation on Brookline High School. Uh, Susan, will you go ahead and introduce the presenters for me? Um, Susan, I don't know if other people can hear you. I cannot. I cannot. You can or cannot? I cannot. I cannot. Cannot. Okay, we cannot hear you. Is this better? Can you? Yes, we can hear you now, Susan. Okay, great. So it is my pleasure to uh, introduce the high school project presentation tonight. Um, uh, joining us are a number of people, so I will quickly run through who they are. Um, the project co-chair, Nancy Heller, Select Board Member Heller, is here with us. Um, the architects um, from William Ron Associates, we have Sam Lasky and Andy Jonick. From our owner's project manager, our OPM Hill International, we have Andy Felix. Uh, fresh off of their world TikTok tour, we have the high school leadership, uh, Anthony Meyer and Hal Mason. And we're very excited. They're giving autographs um, after the after the meeting tonight. Uh, from Skanska, we have Rob Mulligan. I think just Rob. I didn't see anyone else, but if there is, you guys can let me know. And we have our staff, um, Ray Maysack, the building department project manager, and Mac Ellis, who sort of jumped into the fray and um, and worked really hard on this as well. So um, let me just say a couple things. First of all, it's been a, quite a while since the building committee has presented to the school committee. Uh, but that said, there's been a tremendous amount of effort and you hear small updates um, or substantial updates sometimes from, from Helen or from me. Um, and we've been following it up very closely, but it really is sort of a nice moment as we are kind of looking at the end of this year to pull up and say, where are we and what's been accomplished and give you a sense, um, both from a budget and schedule perspective, what's happening um, given, given COVID-19. So we're gonna start by kind of getting a sense of the project, just reminding everyone, because I know a number of you weren't even on school committee when the high school um, debt exclusion passed, and there are many people in the audience um, and we're about to onboard new school committee members. So I just thought it'd be a nice time to kind of pull up and, and look at the whole project. So that said, there are a lot of slides. Um, and if, if you hate that, that's my fault. Um, you can blame me, um, but there are probably more than a hundred photographs and drawings in there, um, just so that you can have a really nice visual sense. Um, especially since we're all in our houses and we're not um, on site. Um, it's been a tremendous team effort and I'm excited to hand it off um, to for a presentation um, by a number of people, but again, both um, Hill and Ron, and I think Skanska might do at the end. And then Nancy Heller will come on at the end and give us a sense of where we are in terms of budget with respect to um, town meeting and some things that um, we should be thinking about uh, for, uh, for next week's public hearing. So take it away. Thank you, Susan. Um, this is Andy Jonick with William Ron Associates and Andy Felix. Do you want to say anything before I begin? Uh, good evening, and I'll speak some more when I get to that part of the presentation. Uh, but uh, thank you, everyone. Okay. I'm going to advance the slideshow here. Okay. Um, I'm uh, again Andy Jonick with William Ron. Uh, and uh, Sam Lasky, principal in charge, uh, is joining me on this call, and he may be chiming, chiming in from time to time. Um, we, uh, this is the, the high school expansion project, so it's, um, it covers many facets of, uh, of the high school. Um, 
This is a diagram showing uh, the, uh, the full scope of the project. There is a new building uh, being constructed um, at the intersection of Tappan and Cypress Streets. We call that the Cypress Building. There's the new stem wing being built um, next to, uh, as part of the main high school building. Um, also part of the, the plan uh, is a, a renovation to Tappan, a third floor renovation, uh, renovation to Cypress Field, um, a new Bookline Hills uh, tea station and an associated plaza, um, and then a uh, 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 renovation, if you will, of the Tappan streetscape, uh, the sidewalks connecting the high school to the, to the new building. Um, the team that's been assembled, uh, Susan touched on this, but William Lawson is architect, um, Phil Skanska, AECOM is the designer for the, the Bookline Hills platform. Um, in terms of schedule, and I will you know, touch on a little bit of the history of the project, but here you can see where we are um, in 2020, um, about a third of the way through construction. Um, we started uh, this me being WRA started um, in late summer and fall of 2017 with schematic design. You can see here the kind of milestones um, uh, that we went through during design to get, get the demolition that started uh, at the end of last summer. And that's both demolition at the high school and at the Cypress building. Um, what are the reasons for the project? Uh, increased enrollment. Um, you know, the forecasting showed that um, on the, uh, the years to come, enrollment will increase uh, significantly. And the solution was a, a new building um, on the center site, a plan for uh, 700 students. Science facilities on the third floor of the existing building are, are outmoded. They are very small. They're something like they range between 700 and 900 square feet. Um, for 26 students, that's that's too small and, and quite frankly unsafe. The new uh, science rooms are, are roughly 1,200 square feet um, in the new building. Um, incorporating the, the education plan um, um, into the project is very important. Um, and also to, uh, to create this cohesive unified campus um, We'll see in a moment that's one of the major goals, especially for the new building and the Cypress site. Um, and then facilities maintenance and upkeep, there are a series of uh, deferred maintenance projects I'll, I'll touch on in a moment. Um, <clears throat> in, uh, in terms of unifying the campus, this diagram shows um, the, the new building on the Cypress site. Um, and this is of, of utmost importance to the project. Um, which was creating a front door um, that fronts the uh, historic Cypress Field, um, much like the Unified Arts Building Tapping in the original high school building. Um, another reason for that was student safety, having that main entrance and access to the building you know, off of the sidewalk along Tappan and not having students going around um, to the side of Cypress. Um, this is the home primarily for the new ninth grade students, um, but integrating, uh, you know, bringing uh, upper class students over to that building and likewise having the freshman students attend classes um, in the main high school is important. Um, so, you know, you know, having this traffic go back and forth uh, across the open campus is important so it didn't just feel like a, you know, standalone uh, school simply for the ninth graders. Um, another feature you'll see as we present the design of the buildings is the um, this connection to the what we call the front porches of the buildings. This is another factor of, of unifying the campus. Each building has its own front porch. So that was a key design element, um, not not only architecturally to create a civic front to these buildings facing the, the green, but it's also uh, we learned early on that students hang out in front of these buildings along Greenway Street. Um, so creating these porches where students can spend time after classes um, 
a, a key element in, in the design of the project. Um, as I mentioned early on um, and throughout the project, uh, we've been meeting with the public, the faculty and students. Um, I don't know how many meetings, we're, we're in the hundreds at this point. Um, and early on, um, before there was a design, um, we scheduled a series of uh, IDP sessions. These are intensive sessions that would happen over several days. Um, and there, there may be um, you know, 10 meetings a day um, where we're meeting with uh, the various departments in the high school, um, culinary arts education, athletics, um, really covering all the bases to learn as much as possible. Um, and that was that was just to get us going with design. And as the design progressed, um, we met with other community members, literally in uh, the abutters and the neighbors' uh, living rooms, uh, to present the project. Um, we had open houses um, at the high school to talk to students, uh, faculty meetings. You know, we met with science faculty several times. Um, to really drill down on the, the design of the labs themselves and the overall layout. Um, this is a, um, it's a little bit hard to see, but we actually mocked up a full scale um, uh, a lab with foam core with fake sinks, fake gas turrets um, in the MLK room at the high school and met with the faculty with a tape measure to, to check all dimensions and um, you know, worked very closely with them on the, the design of those labs. Um, more recently, uh, we held an open house uh, to showcase the physical models. This is, this is uh, one of the ways in which we work. And at the end of the project, these models get quite large. You can see the Cypress building is about five feet long. And um, much of the community stopped by to say hello and, and show them you know, what we've been working on for the last few years. Um, to, to touch on the Cypress building, um, again, these, these goals of creating a unified campus, engaging the students, um, uh, serving all students, uh, we, we work to incorporate and to, um, some of these design ideas into the project. Um, when it comes to um, you know, the unified campus I talked about is the civic front to the building facing uh, Cypress Field, which is at the bottom of the page here. Um, when we started looking at the organization of the Cypress Building, uh, we looked to locate the most civic and public uh, spaces in the building uh, at the front facing Cypress Field. Um, not only for the school itself, but also these buildings are heavily used, as everyone knows, um, after hours. And so it could be a, a community space. Um, so the Cypress building has the cafeteria uh, front and center. Off of the cafeteria um, is a, this is slides called the white box. This is a really a black box theater. Um, the kitchen servery, of course, serving that, um, that cafeteria, the main office, um, just off the air, this area here. On the second floor, uh, the library is a meeting room um, that is the same size and, and uh, function as the MLK room that, um, at the high school. Um, those those spaces front of the cafeteria and again front Cypress Field. Um, the, uh, the idea for the, the, I call it the building blocks of the high school, the, the classrooms, um, <clears throat> was to take this um, it's a interdisciplinary approach where all these classrooms are general use. However, the idea is that um, you, know, you could have math, social studies, um, English, one to uh, next to one another. Uh, faculty uh, will have a touchdown space and faculty collaboration. So faculty members do not technically own their classrooms. Um, this also gives uh, HAL and others flexibility to move classes around. Um, well, this could be math, English, and history. It could also all be math classes. It's really up to um, the team scheduling of classes. Um, another very important um, part of this design is creating collaboration spaces, spaces out in the hallways uh, where students can gather and meet um, and study. 
Um, so you'll see that the hallway does have these, these breakout spaces um, outside of the classrooms. Um, that was something we learned early on. Again, at the high school, we found students sitting on the floors. Um, there are a couple of spaces where they have big picnic tables that they use. Um, and we'll see in a moment how we integrated um, that, that element of the, the original high school uh, into this design. And again, this shows those same collaboration spaces. Um, and I have a couple of um, three-dimensional images of what those spaces will look like uh, in a moment. Um, and moving to the outside of the building, here you can see that uh, cafeteria, which is a two-story space with a front porch. Uh, over Andy, the this field. is Sam. Yes. Could yep. you just explain that that cafeteria is a, just show where it is over the MBTA track, just so everyone's clear on that? Yes. Um, thank you. We, you can see it right here in the distance. These are the MBA, MBTA tracks um, and the, the new platform. About three quarters or two thirds of it is out in the open air. Another third is underneath the building. And the trains will pass um, immediately below uh, the cafeteria, um, below Cypress Street Bridge, as they do now, and the daylight on the other end. Um, this is an, a view of one of our models um, at the intersection of Captain Street and Cypress, where you can see that front porch and that into that area. Another view from as you approach um, along the existing sidewalk along Captain Street. This will be your view. Um, there's the grand stair taking you up to the main entrance, and that first floor is above the tracks. Uh, there's also an elevator here that provides accessible entrance into the school um, right at the base of the school. On the interior, this is a view of the, um, of the cafeteria. You can see that new conference room on the second floor of the library in the distance. Uh, so the, there are some garage doors here that are open to the, the server. Um, well, that refer to this as a South Collaboration Space. This is one of those orange squares in the previous diagram. There's a two-story space where students can work um, and meet. There's a shortcut stair to get to the upper level. There are two of these spaces, one that connects levels one and two, another one that connects levels three and four. On the far end of the building, there are eight uh, physics labs, um, and they are uh, organized around a double height um, space. Uh, this became an important element, especially for those physics classrooms where they can do gravity experiments um, over the railing here. There are also large garage doors that interconnect those labs um, with the, the collaboration space. And here you can see that that idea of bringing the, of using a picnic table as a focal point for the space incorporated. Uh, just to touch on landscape, um, you can see the, uh, I'll, I'll go th walk you through the MBTA plaza plan uh, a little bit later. Um, and, and touch on the streetscape a little bit later, but this is that sidewalk coming down towards the stair. We widen the sidewalk on the corner um, of Tappan and Cypress. The sidewalk gets wider along Cypress Street. Um, on the west side of the building, there is a, uh, a loading dock and down at the lower level where trucks uh, will be able to pull in inside the building uh, for loading and unloading. Um, so noises can be kept to a minimum, um, keeping in mind that your brother's house is very close uh, to the back of the building. There's also an egress path. Um, off of the MBTA platform, this is this will be new. You're on the platform, you can walk over the drinking road along this pathway. It does go under part of the building that's overhanging that location. Uh, sustainability is also a key uh, part of both the STEM wing um, and the Cypress building. The building is designed to meet um, lead silver certification. Um, this is a I won't go every, through every item on this list. Um, one of the key uh, components of the building, though, is the, the efficient um, HVAC equipment. 
Um, there is uh, even elements that go around the building which allow um, those air handling units to be shut down after hours, which saves quite a bit of energy. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with energy use intensity, figures the town's goal target is a, a 30. Very efficient, we're just under that at about 29. Moving on to the stem wing, um, again, this is tied to these, the design um, responding to these original goals. Um, they're uh, with the stem wing, the sides of the porch, another key idea is connecting. Um, well, let me back up for a minute. The, the wing of the high school that was located. Um, where the stem wing is going, better to look at an image here. Originally, the Roberts wing um, had a single door with a very small staircase inside. The majority of students in the morning would use this as the entrance. So although the symbolic entry is in the central building of the high school, um, we realized early on that this is, this is really the, the major entry where most students come into the building. Um, so one of the goals for the organization of the STEM wing was to open this up both for access, but also to connect the space to the quad. Um, and we created a um, seating area uh, here with abundant glass. So now um, you'll be able to have that visual connection to the quad. There's a door here, so you have direct access. Um, but we, besides Facilitating uh, circulation through the first floor, we also uh, made it easier to connect with the upper floors vertically. So there's a, um, a stair here. There's also a new elevator um, in this wing. Uh, previously, there was no elevator. Um, you can see here we've got all three levels shown. Um, that blue arrow takes you up the stair which then you're on access with the hallway that leads to the, the auditorium. So in the evenings when there's town meeting, I anticipate most people will come through these doors, go up the stair, or use the elevator, and go um, straight through the auditorium. Um, another key element um, that you can see in these diagrams is that the yellow hallways extend all the way to the exterior. Now for those of you who have walked around the high school currently, there are limited views to the exterior. It's really only when you're crossing these bridges that you, you know where you are. When you enter the stem wing, you'll be able to see directly to the outside, to the south, um, and to the east, across Cypress Field. Um, in terms of the, the building organization, there are a chemistry classroom, class lab stack on the north side of the building, up to the right, um, and the biology classroom with access to uh, southern sunlight um, are located to the south. And then on the first floor, um, there are a couple of maker spaces. This is designed for uh, electronics, robotics. Um, it is, there is infrastructure should you know, the program and really change over time. If the school wanted laser cutters, they, they, they will have a capability to turn those up. There's also a science um, resource room. And I'll admit this is a little bit of an older photo from early in the design process, but um, a different type of maker space uh, in this area of the building. Um, and another important key element here is the community cafe. This is the culinary arts restaurant. It used to be located in the Roberts room. Um, there's a, pitch, a kitchen that um, supports that space. Um, but this is, again, one of these flexible, flexible used spaces where it would be used by culinary arts during the daytime, um, but can also be uh, used as a cafe um, after hours. Uh, so education groups could meet here, but also can double as a classroom. Um, this, these diagrams show those um, those uh, direct views to the exterior 
at the end of these hallways are uh, breakout spaces, much like the Cypress building where these, these classrooms, and there's a little bit of a neighborhood here where they can use this breakout space and hang up at the eastern end of the building. Um, and I should add that there is a running level stair that does bring you up to the third floor once you um, arrive on level three. Uh, this diagram shows the, the um, evolution of the plan here. This is the original Roberts Wing. You can see that double loaded corridor. There's a little bit of seating at the, this is the cafeteria, some overflow seating. Um, the new first floor opens that up, that yellow space being completely public um, with seating areas outside the cafe and overlooking the quad. Um, those are that's, you know, likely to be very popular as an overflow space for the cafeteria. Moving to the outside, um, we designed this front porch with a uh, colonnade uh, in keeping with the architecture of the existing building existing facades in the main building. So you can see that on the entrance, and I'll, I'll note that the previous entrance is not accessible. Only by the stairs, there's a sloped walk that leads to the entrance here. So you, you can see uh, that entrance by making it wider and making it more accessible. And on the southern side, you can see how the mass on this step um, to reduce the kind of scale of the building that faces the couple of shots in the interior. This is just inside the entrance looking towards that culinary arts cafe or restaurant. Um, in the street, you can see out through these windows, you can see a column right there. And this is a science resource center on, on the left, and a maker space on the right, a picnic table and a collaboration space um, where those those spaces with these garage doors can open up and things can go freely from the, the public space to this collaborate to the, uh, the maker space. And this is a view again on the first floor looking towards one of those maker spaces. Stem wing again uh, is designed to meet the lead silver. Um, there's abundant natural light. Um, there are several sustainable features. I will say regarding the EUI, um, couldn't meet that town standard security simply because the, the building, the heating systems are fed from the existing boilers over at the UAB building. Moving along to um, the third floor renovation. Um, so this is the, the third floor northern wing of the existing high school um, where the existing science classrooms are located. So when these, the new science classrooms are built, um, these will be vacated and this renovation um, uh, design changes those labs into general use classrooms. Um, I apologize, I don't have a, a colored plan here, um, but this is the program for those spaces. Um, again, general use classrooms, there's some, excuse me, special education offices, um, the learning center, an ACE science classroom, um, and some Excel classroom. It's, it's a, we call it a light touch renovation. So, uh, some of these rooms were simply uh, redoing the finishes tapping the gas turrets, um, removing the sinks that, that line the room that they were previously at lab. Tapping renovation. Um, here, this is the first uh, entry level plan. Tapping street is here. This is the entry lobby of the clearing pool. Um, there's a fitness center, dance studio. We'll see what the women's locker room um, occupied much of the first floor. Um, the, the program um, for this renovation project was to create some much needed classroom space for health and fitness. Um, the 
make use of those oversized locker rooms or banks of um, of showers. Maybe twenty percent or less of those showers were used. We're reclaiming some of that space uh, again for a classroom. This is a community room um, that will be used um, by Parks and Rec, um, creating a connection between the lobbies, um, and then we're doing the fitness center. Um, and you can see here the new, new locker room on this level. We're down to the lower level. Um, the men's locker room will be located in the team room, um, some new offices for health and fitness. Um, there are some other very light touch upgrades, uh, some of the other spaces. Moving on to Tap and Streetscape, as I mentioned before, this is the new design of the sidewalk, the landscape along this edge of Tap and Street. The main driver of this is increasing student safety. Currently, that sidewalk is five to six feet wide. Um, this plan uh, changes the sidewalk so it's 10 feet wide and creates a, um, a buffer um, between the curb and the, the walking path. Also, <clears throat> uh, raising the crosswalks here um, will help slow down traffic. A very wide raised crosswalk <clears throat> by the Cypress Building um, that will also facilitate circulation for, for commuters coming across the field. Um, and we're redoing the raised crosswalk here at the intersection between the Chapel and Summer. Um, and if you could speak up just a little bit when you're talking. Sure. Uh, Thanks. Um, this is the <clears throat> uh, the existing streetscape. Um, you can see there are uh, 53 school parking spaces. So some of the development in terms of the MBTA Plaza there has been a, a reduction in some of the spaces. I'll show you that in a moment. And you can see that very uh, skinny sidewalk right along the street edge. And you can imagine with 700 students in the new Cypress building moving back and forth to the Tappan or UAB or the main building, it, it's very important to have a, um, a sufficiently wide sidewalk for that volume of students moving back and forth. So that, that's really the genesis of this part of the project. And you can see the actually 11 feet that that pathway um, and there are some street trees you know, defining that safety buffer along the roadway um, there are there will be 10 school spaces here in this uh, new parking lot uh, those MBTA spaces that uh, exist or existed um, at the Pine Hills will remain in six more spaces here um, do the, some new accessible spaces down at this end. The, the raised crosswalk, the number of spaces along this edge has been reduced to 42. Um, there are there are other improvements um, with cycling, um, which I'll touch on in a moment. More comment. Um, part of this plan was to also improve. Um, the quality of the, the edge of the sidewalk here in the path and landscape. Uh, there's a, some benches here. Um, uh, redesigning that, that edge where currently if you go out there today, there's about a four to five foot um, brick wall along this edge of, just outside the um, So in terms of uh, improving uh, cycling safety, um, there will be sharrows located along um, Lappin Street, and the bike lane, and proposed to the transportation board, a bike box at this, this edge, um, bike lane along Davis Street, so it's not the lane along, excuse me, along Green. Um, the, uh, this shows all the locations for, for bike parking, increasing the number of bike parking spaces by about 40% over what, what exists today. 
that covers the, the streetscape improvements. Um, moving along to deferred maintenance, um, these are items that are originally part of the project that um, many people don't see. The, the elevators in the high school um, will be replaced. Um, new boilers in the Unified Arts Building, those are the boilers that serve the main the main high school building, happen and UAB. Uh, fire protection upgrades um, in the high school, uh, fire alarm replacement throughout the high school, that, that's actually part of the STEM project. Um, heat exchanger replacements, uh, there's an oil tank between UAB um, and Korean pool, um, and some other our mechanical pumps slated for upgrade. Um, moving along to the MBTA Plaza, this is uh, the plaza that's at the serving Brookline Hill Station. Um, at the base of the, the grand stair that takes you up to the Cypress Building, this is that widened crosswalk. Um, and you can see the snapshot of part of the renovated. Um, Cypress Field design, uh, which was not a part of our scope. Uh, Weston and Sampson worked with uh, Parks and Open Space to, to design that. We, we worked closely with them to coordinate um, both projects, so it's a seamless connection between this side of Happen and the northern side. Um, recognizing those hundreds of commuters that come across the field, making this a wide uh, threshold. Um, and to maintain that width as you move onto the out, outbound and inbound platform, um, creating multiple accessible paths from multiple directions is important. The plaza itself, um, these uh, round rectangles are wooden benches, so there is a, a place to sit. Um, public urban space. Um, can see here just on this edge, this is that egress path off the platform. Actually, offers a, a way to access the inbound platform. Um, about eight months ago, this is if you're crossing that wide crosswalk that I just showed in our drawings, this is what, what you would see as you approach the fine hills. Um, this is what you'll see. 2021, when the project is completed, you can see that wide access directly onto the platform. Cypress is on the left, and those are the benches. There's a more aerial view. Um, so there's just an urban park like setting. There's some blue bikes, um, access to the platform. School parking shown to the right. Before we move on to construction photos, should I pause and does anyone have any questions? I, I just wanted to take a minute. Thank you so much for all of this, the information and the details. It's really great to, to see the designs and see some of the hard work that's been happening over uh, the last number of months. I just wanted to touch base to see, I had heard mention of something like 100 slides. And so I did want to just touch base to where we are in the presentation and to see if maybe we can move through, um, you know, move move through a little bit quicker, because I am a little worried about time. Sure. Um, I'm about to hand it off to Rob Rob Mulligan to talk about the construction photos. So yeah, Rob, and you, why don't we, quickly. Andy, why don't we just do the construction photos okay. quickly? Just, just cycle through them so sure. I think people know what's what, and let's just say you know, okay. which is STEM and which is Cypress. Let's just try to go fast here. I also think we're on like slide 70 or something. So yeah, we're, we're on 68. Yep. So let's, you know, I think, I think most people will understand what, what we're seeing here. So just, okay. let's keep going, Andy. So this is All right, so we'll, next one. Uh, I'll just, it's... I'll just run through these quickly. So obviously this is the Roberts wing that we all had known. And then the next slide shows some of the work done over the last summer to reroute utilities and, uh, to, to allow the demolition. And so here the building's gone and the foundations are started. This was a little few months ago. Foundations are happening. And if you've been out keep going, if we've been out there recently, you've seen that steel has just started going up. 
uh, even during our COVID time. Uh, these are complex moments in the project where the new meets the old and ensuring the old stays standing and, um, and here's the steel going up. And um, so that, that will continue um, as, um, as more, more starts to arrive over the next weeks. Uh, we'll keep going here. Um, so let's, uh, let's keep going. So this is that stem and then the Cypress building. Obviously there was a building that was first thing was to demolish that building. And um, then there's a, an awful lot of complexity as you can imagine to build over the MBTA tracks uh, for a lot, a lot of enabling work to move the wires that you know, power the trains and, and, and build around these uh, bungalows that are there, the, the little gray buildings that we've all seen for years. So, these just give you a sense of the complexity of, of doing that work. Um, foundation work is happening and, uh, and really what's, what's happening now is getting ready to be able to build um, the, the, that cafeteria floor that will cross the tracks. That's, that's coming hopefully soon. <laughs> it's all, all coming up pretty soon as that's kind of the next step on the Cypress building. So, um, so going a couple more you can just get a sense of you know what it what it was like and, and the level of complexity to do this work um, that Skanska has been building uh, to get ready to build across the tracks here so that that'll be the next thing everyone um, I guess will see that'll start to be more obvious what's happening as that happens on the project maybe so this is keep, yeah let's keep going um, so I, I'm not sure if we need to get into this level of detail because I think Andy Felix, you probably need to get into the, the budget discussion. Yes. Uh, I just sorry, Julie, say, go ahead. I saw when we skipped through. I do think it does probably make worth mentioning. I think on that slide we just passed, it shows completion in is that December of 2021. That is correct. And I did just want to point out that 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 is. To, to see if that is an adjustment. I know we were originally targeting for fall. Well, yeah, were we? We were targeting August and when COVID hit, um, this is where we're at today. Okay. That's why I just wanted to call attention to that before we move to the next section, but thanks. We had some um, delays, I'll be real brief, and uh, we were gonna catch up and um, then we just got hit and we didn't know what hit us. And this is what where we know we are today. Okay, thank you, Ray. Welcome. So getting into budget again, this is Andy Felix from Hill International. Um, just to recap, uh, thanks to Andy and um, and uh, Skanska team for uh, sh uh, showing the pictures earlier. Now we'll talk the numbers. This was the vote uh, that was uh, occurred back in May of uh, May June of 2018. The budget was set at 205.6 million. Categorized into hard, so hard costs, soft costs, FFE, real estate, other, and Cypress Field. Uh, just give uh, everyone a timeline again. We saw it in a bar chart, but now we're showing in a list. Spring of 17, uh, HMFH did the concept design, then William Ron joined the team, uh, did the schematics back in February of 18. Next slide. All right. Uh, again, just a couple of bullet lists. Um, uh, again, I mentioned May of 18, uh, the town vote. Uh, the CM, Skanska, was hired in June of 18. Uh, reconcile a good faith estimate in the fall of 18. We went into the design de development estimate, um, finalized in January of 19, which happened to be the first time we issued uh, early construction packages to start um, with the subcontractors that would help get us to this point. Uh, in phases, uh, and then the 60% estimate was done last summer. Uh, this is a summary recap of the design development estimate where we were within budget. The hard cost roughly was 133 uh, million, and the uh, uh, v value management effort that was taking place back then when we saw that things were starting to trend a bit higher, uh, we got it back to the budgets. 60% uh, effort as well to last summer, as I mentioned, the hard cost again creeped up a little bit more. Uh, we came up with, uh, with another 43 items that were accepted to get us closer to the budget 
adjusted the soft cost as necessary uh, to allow for the project to still be as of last summer uh, to be able to be managed within the budget. Uh, the um, situation we're in right now is the current uh, project uh, GMP, which is a guaranteed maximum price after the Cypress building, the STEM building, elevator modernization, and all of the work for the MBTA station. All of that work was essentially bid uh, throughout all of last year into the December, January timeframe. Some numbers we still have to award, but the GMP has submitted uh, by the construction manager is already at 145 million uh, based on the unfortunate trend of the market last year uh, was really high. We'll get into a couple of slides shortly explaining uh, some comparisons of our project to some other uh, high school and um, elementary school projects in the area. Some of the things that have changed, the other thing, I'm sorry, Andy, if you can go back, I want to point out, as Ray alluded to, when we were going through these numbers uh, to get to the point of the budget presentation early in March, that was prior to all the COVID uh, stay-at-home orders. So we've been under a different uh, scenario since then. Uh, we are calculating uh, as fast as we can guesstimate the cost of this impact. There have been a lot of delays we didn't get into. Uh, this during the, uh, the earlier presentation, but one of the things that has impacted Cypress building uh, is the MBTA suspended support of the work. Uh, in other words, we're doing work on their property to do the overbuild. Uh, in order to do that, MBTA has to shut the power off to the trains, divert passengers, and provide staff in order to support and monitor the work that we had to do. That support by the MBTAs, um, they suspended as of March 23rd, and they sure. extended it a few times. And that is now as of uh, May 18th is when they are telling us they will reinstate their support to our project. So unfortunately, that's been several weeks, almost two months uh, of, of delays just in that part of Cyprus. Um, so schedule and cost impacts are still fully being analyzed. Um, hence what Ray mentioned earlier with me longer projection of the schedule uh, at this moment, but we're still evaluating it. Uh, next slide. Several things that have changed um, that we knew about back then is unprecedented escalation, several unknown conditions, which we won't, we won't get into all of the items, um, uh, stand basement uh, community meetings, as Andy alluded to, the plaza uh, actually grew in size a bit during the community involvement process about a year ago. Uh, with a lot of feedback from the community. They wanted the plaza larger and they wanted some connections to the uh, Cypress field. So the scope grew a bit. Uh, and the working with, in, and around the MBTA has um, increased significant costs uh, as well to, uh, to the project more than we had anticipated. Keep uh, going, Andy. This is a graph taken from the Massachusetts School Building Authority website. Um, this project is not funded uh, partially by, or reimbursed, I should say, by the MSBA, but they track several um, projects throughout the state. Uh, the boxes on the right side of the graph, and you can go to the website itself and click on any one of the boxes. It represents a school, um, whether it's high school, middle school, elementary school, that is in some phase of construction or pricing. And you can actually see what those projects uh, values are estimated at. From that website, we just took a few samplings of where the high school project expansion lies compared to some other school projects that are in various phases of design or in construction or about to go uh, under construction. Uh, we're kind of in the middle, but we're also uh, on the higher end trending to some of the other schools um, that uh, as of economic conditions prior to COVID were dictating uh, these numbers. So uh, I think all projects, including MSBA, are still evaluating what the impacts are uh, from the stay at home um, uh, environment that we're under. So just a quick recap, the budget was 205. The forecast as of uh, early March was 237. If we do complete other parts of the projects that have not been bid yet, and that includes third floor, Deferred maintenance, Tappan, and uh, Cypress Field. Uh, if we were to move forward, and that's part of what's going to be presented at several 
uh, meetings, uh, public hearings over the next uh, month or so in preparation for the town meeting in June. Uh, but right now we're trending uh, roughly, if those projects proceed, 32 million over. Um, that does not include uh, COVID, which we're still evaluating what those cost impacts would be. Next slide. Nancy, Susan. Uh, Nancy, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Now. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, we have some some difficult choices to make uh, because we need uh, we can't uh, spend more than we have been appropriated. So in order to get to the thirty two million, and it's likely going to be higher. Um, we have a few choices. One is we could try to increase funding through Trap Town Meeting, and we have submitted a warrant article for an for an additional appropriation. Um, I think that you all know that you're having a public hearing on that, and I'm not exactly sure of the date in the next week or two. Uh, the advisory committee is holding a public hearing on that issue uh, toward the end of March, uh, toward the end of May. Um, so hopefully we'll have better information about COVID um, and our, our strategies are to uh, look at the, at the favorable bond issues that we've had. Um, the project originally, when we went to the voters, we said it was going to cost uh, 5%. The interest rate would be 5%. Now, uh, since we've been bidding the project, we've had very, very good and much lower interest rate um, bonding. So, for instance, uh, one of the, uh, the time uh, about a month ago, we went out for some a large portion of the bonds because the interest rate was so good. And instead of having 5%, it was 2.44%, which is really great. Uh, the other thing that happened is right before that, um, uh, our bond rating was maintained as AAA. So that really helps us. Uh, the, the bonding before the 2.44% um, was at 2.97. So I'm working with Melissa Goff and Gen Gina Franconi, our treasurer, to see what the difference in terms of how much we pro promised the voters that it would cost and uh, what it's actually going to cost. And um, so we'll see how that comes out. I don't have the answer yet, but I hopefully we'll have it uh, by the time the hearings come up. The second thing we're doing is pursuing the MBTA cost uh, sharing, trying to shift some of the diversion costs uh, to the MBTA. And we had started that process um, a few months ago. And we were making, we felt like we were making some progress, but then COVID hit us and everything fell off the table. So we cannot at this point uh, estimate what that's going to be. We were hoping that they would pick up the diversions because those are the weekends and, and, and nights, they're very expensive. Um, and I, you know, but I just can't tell you where that's going to be because of COVID. Uh, right now, as Andy mentioned to you, they have suspended all support, so we can't even do any work in there's what they call their zone of influence. Their, the easement that we have with them uh, prohibits us from working when there's no MBTA personnel, even if the power is shut down. They want to make sure we're not going to, you know, cut the power line or do whatever, make a mistake in any way. So. Um, We've already, in order to meet, to keep the budget down, removed scopes of work, and I think Andy showed you that before. We've done it both Tappan and the third floor, as well as some other uh, minor things around the project. But if we do not get ad additional funding through town meeting, we will have to remove some significant scopes of work. And it really kills me. I hate, I really hate it. Uh, we would have to remove Taffin, which we removed in the uh, in the uh, renovation in the 90s. So it, it would be really a crime. Uh, the third floor renovation would be sacrificed. We would have to sacrifice some deferred maintenance, Cypress Field, uh, some streetscape, etc. So 
Um, those are dire, in my view, dire consequences, and uh, we're trying to work pretty hard to uh, make sure that it doesn't happen. Um, and, you know, I don't, I, I can't really, oh, the other thing I wanted to tell you on a different note is that uh, because the front door of the building at Cyprus, the former 111 Cyprus, has changed to Tappan Street, the town has now readdressed the building. So we have a new address. It's 22 Tappan. Uh, the MBTA station is 24 Tappan. Um, so we have to get ourselves used to calling it the 22 Tappan building. Um, it's hard to do, but uh, we'll we'll over time, we'll practice and make sure it happens. At any rate, um, that's basically the situation with the um, with the budget. Good. Well, so thank you all so much. So this is, we're probably at about the 50 minute mark if I'm sort of tracking my, my timer. Um, why don't we take some questions and then I want to sort of let Anthony and Hal have the last word because they've been kind of living this real time um, and kind of let them have the final closing thoughts. But can we take some questions at this point? I have a question, Susan. Go ahead. So I noticed that you had the double, there, there was the double asterisk next to unknown cost related to COVID. And I was wondering if we have any built in costs already, and then there are, we're expecting additional unknown, or if in the numbers that we are at now, include any impacts from COVID and delays? No, it does not. It does not include any. And then um, another question that I had received, uh, I, I believe that I know the answer to this, but two community members have asked me, is, is there any chance that as a result of COVID-19 and some shutdown of construction that has happened across the state and, you know, desires for work or changes in work expectation, is there any sense that there might be savings that could happen from rebidding anything? And if someone if someone could just answer that, okay. it hasn't been something that people are asking. Actually, I uh, had a conversation with Ray, I believe, and Andy about this very issue because some people have asked me as well. Mm -hmm. And we've really bid uh, all of the Tappan, uh, I mean, the, um, the STEM and Cypress buildings. So we really can't change that now. Um, it is likely, and I guess Andy and, and Ray and others could speak to this, it's likely that if we, we have it bid Tappan, and if we do uh, get to go ahead with Tappan in the third floor, it may well be that those would be cheaper, um, given what's happened with COVID, but that's anybody's guess. Andy, can you weigh in? Uh, yes, just to clarify one thing you said earlier, yes, we have bid all of Cyprus and STEM. There's a few trades that we haven't released yet because we are close to the current budget and we have to wait at least until town vote uh, in order to get comfort level in order to release the remainder of them. Even if we were to rebid, which a couple of them uh, really don't have to happen work-wise until next year, it's not going to move the needle on the budgets uh, we're already uh, behind on for Cypress and staff. Um, as you mentioned, Nancy, it's, it's, a, it's a guess uh, as to what the market will do uh, in, the, in the next bidding environment for these other sub-projects. Um, my office, as well as Skanska's office, and on. we obviously have other projects throughout the area that are in different phases, and we're checking in with our colleagues to see if any of them are experiencing real-time bids at the moment uh, in order for us to confirm and inform the town as much information as we can gather. But right now, we think it could be a savings opportunity, but we could also see it go the other way where people aren't sure. With the social distancing, we don't know how that's going to affect the construction overall efficiency-wise. So it's really hard to predict. Um, I think all construction, what I've heard, is grappling with the same issue. If anyone else has a question, please chime in. Oh, Barbara, go ahead. It's, I can't see everybody at once, and I can't see that even all the hand raises at once. So, Barbara, please. Barbara, you're on mute. You're still on mute. 
me? Oh, okay. It just, um, when you say that deferred maintenance, we might not be able to do, could you be more specific about what that maintenance is for the, the building? Buildings. The deferred maintenance has to do with boilers, uh, the oil tank between the two buildings, uh, fire alarm, elevators. We are moving ahead with the elevators. Um, it's just something we would have to plan for the future. If we don't get the vote, the building commission told us directly, they said plan for a no vote in June. So we are planning for a no vote. And we need to keep the project moving forward. That would be the Cypress building and the STEM building. It's very, as people have said, draconian, but um, the cuts will be substantial and I don't think anybody will be happy. Thank you. Anyone else? Please chime in because I can't see hands. Susan, I just have one more if nobody else has any others, which is, um, Nancy, you were saying that you thought by the public hearings, you might have more of a sense of the cost impacts from COVID. That's no, 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 that's not what I said. No, I'll have more of, an, of a sense. I'm working with Melissa Goff and uh, Gina Franconi to put together a schedule of how much the project is costing us, given the recent bond, lower bond ratings versus how much it we said it was going to cost because the 205.6 million is not really the only cost. There's interest. So we have to pay the principal back, but we also uh, have to pay interest. The, and the interest rate we had uh, initially um, uh, forecasted was 5%, uh, but the interest rates have come down considerably. So I'm looking at that as a way of convincing town meeting that uh, there's wiggle room in the in the sense of uh, what we told the taxpayers it would cost. So I don't know the answer yet, but I'm hoping that we'll have it by the. My plan is to have it by the uh, by the public hearings. And then, do we? What do we have a sense of then for what the timing is for when we would know the cost impacts of COVID-19? Just there's the concern that if we were to go to town meeting and get this extra money we might still have to remove all of those or many of those scopes of work or vice versa. If we don't get the money, we have to remove many of those and additional because of additional costs because of COVID-19. I, um, I can chime in. Um, this is Andy. So the, the co-chairs obviously have tasked our team to come up with what if scenarios, mm -hmm. which some of it is we'll know some direct costs that we can calculate and some um, guesses because we're still developing, um, uh, I should say, assessing what it's going to be. And uh, just to, unfortunately, just to make sure everybody's aware, until the stay at home um, advisory is uh, lifted and we know what are the phases of opening up construction sites and if there's still a social distance, we can't, we're going to take some guesses, but until that development, uh, those instructions come to the construction team, um, we won't really know just due to timing between, say, May 18th, it starts to get lifted uh, and the town meeting is in June. We're going to make our best guess and information given to the town. But if the stay at home extends even further into June, um, we're just getting closer to the town meeting. So in other words, we're taking an, our best educated guess, but until we have instructions from the uh, state government on how to run the construction, we can't really calculate to a finite number. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll just say one other thing. Um, construction is a lot of trades on a floor. Maybe social distancing is one trade per floor. What does that equate to a cost? We don't know that yet. And so if, if we're directed to go that way, that would be an impact for the future. Mm -hmm. We're assuming that with proper social distancing, we'll be able to continue our construction as usual, but I don't think that's gonna be the case. And Skanska has continually uh, raised that issue to us. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're coming up on the one hour mark. I'm not seeing any other hands. Um, so in, I think what I'll do, first of all, thank you to everyone who presented. I wanna give uh, Hal and Anthony the last word again. They've been living with this. They've been working with the teachers throughout um, the design process. 
and they'll be the ones if this doesn't pass to try to live with the consequences of that. So let me give them um, the last word and, and just say thank you to everyone. Thanks, Susan. Why don't I start, Hal, um, and then um, you've been so close to this project given uh, your role with physical plant. Um, as always, first, thanks for the presentation and for uh, allowing Hal and I, and I to be here. Um, I always begin with gratitude, and it's hard not to feel grateful in the midst of COVID-19 and everything in front of us right now and distant distance learning um, for the last seven weeks and the next eight weeks to imagine that indeed there is a world when we're going to have this beautiful BHS uh, renovation and expansion project complete. So we're just thankful to the school committee, the building commission, the select board, the BHS building committee, that really the town as a whole for supporting the debt exclusion. And then to the folks who Susan mentioned, Ron, Hill, Skanska, the building department um, personified by Ray, um, district leaders and school. I just want to emphasize what Andy touched on in his presentation. I believe we had a really good process um, and he captured it from 1718 and beyond. And even though I started this role in 1617 as we wrote the education plan that drove it, I know there were years and years of thinking about renovating and expanding Brookline High School. So I just appreciate Ron's approach, which they promised as they bid, it's listen, 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 and wait to pick up the pen and draw. And you heard that in how much feedback they solicited, you know, at least 118 meetings, um, which I didn't know that I believed when they presented that, but um, I believe it now having sat with many of them as they sought feedback from experts, uh, revised and then brought it back to the group. Um, and for sure, given um, our escalating population, we need more space to support our um, rich uh, and deep academic and educational program you also saw the public spaces um, that they, the design has embedded um, between porches and picnic tables and breakout spaces and the overflow in the science center. Um, I'd also just emphasize, we see Brookline High School very much as a public institution. Yes, we're a public school. We're also a school for the public. Um, we have a long history with the rec department, with adult ed. And so I think that's important to see the community room in the tap and gym, to see the white box and no offense to our current cafeteria, but I'm not excited <laughs> about inviting the public into that space. Um, teenagers can grin and bear it, but a new cafeteria at 22 Tappan, um, we're really excited about that. The MBTA Plaza that's evolved is just amazing. So, um, I'm really excited about this, uh, and I know Hal is too, and he's done an incredible job working closely um, with the building committee and with Skanska and Ron, so I'll turn it over to my dear colleague, Harold Al Mason. Well, thank you. I just want to note that on Twitter, the current cafeteria has taken offense and is already tweeting against you, so you're going to have to deal with that. Well deserved. Uh, thanks, Anthony, and I second everything he said. Um, you know, there's so much uncertainty now in terms of COVID and what's going to happen. But I will say that, you know, my goal is to have a great schedule for next year and figure out how to get kids into the building, uh, including the 115 buildings, including Tappan, including the UA, including Old Lincoln, and then to manage what will happen at the beginning of the 2021 school year. And I'll say that Skanska has been terrific and they're, they understand the priorities that we have in order to make school work for that year. You know, which piece needs to be prioritized over which other piece, what's going to give us a, a footprint that's going to allow us to bring in the class of 2025 and make sure that, you know, through all the disruption that we expect over obviously these months, but through next year and beyond, beyond the disruptions introduced just by living in a construction project, but all the new disruptions introduced by COVID that we're still able to provide the real quality Brookline High School environment, the experience for kids, for families, for the whole town, uh, you know, and who knows, 
there's going to be a lot of, of, of uh, uh, more, un there'll be a, many more unknowns that will be thrown at us as we know and conditions that will be thrown at us. But I, I have confidence that with Skanska, with Ron working with us, uh, with Hill, that we'll be able to, to come to um, uh, a good place for the, as good as we can uh, for those years. Great, thank you so much, Julie. Back to you. Um, we can let our team go, but just just with our gratitude. Yes, thank you very, very, very much. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to make a mention of an item of I'll call it under new business, but I'm going to take it a little bit out of order. Um, rather than covering at the beginning of the meeting, I wanted what we had. Um, you know, outside speakers who are coming, um, and I want to do it now, is uh, Mr. Glover has uh, submitted his, resign unfortunately for us, he has submitted his resignation uh, to the school committee. The term for the last election for Ms. Fetterspiel, myself, and Mr. Glover uh, was going to end uh, on May 5th, which is next Tuesday. Uh, but because of COVID-19, the election has been postponed. And so as of right now, that's scheduled for June 9th. Um, and so uh, but Mr. Uh, Glover has submitted his resignation uh, and it, which would be effective as of next Tuesday, which is the original uh, length of the term. And I just wanted, uh, in these unusual times, usually when we have someone leaving us on school committee, all the school committee members are able to be together in person to go around and to thank, you know, that the, the, our beloved fellow members of school committee and to share a few words. Um, and in these unusual times where we're not together in person, but are still together, I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to thank Michael for his six years of service on the school committee and his service on numerous member, uh, numerous subcommittees and chairing our policy subcommittee and our negotiation subcommittee and just really, really stepping up and being involved in so many ways. And so I'm going to open up the floor to some of my fellow school committee members uh, to, to take a minute if there was anything that they wanted to say, um, if, they, if they wanted to say with this being likely being Michael's last full school committee meeting. Uh, yes, uh, Barbara. Well, I am. I will miss Michael greatly on the school committee because I think he has a legal understanding. Excuse me, this phone is going to ring now. Um, he has. Uh, he has a, a great legal understanding. Lace. I'm sorry. There's nothing I can do about it. It's in the, <laughs> in the kitchen. It will stop after this ring. Um, a great legal understanding laced with good common sense and wide experience, and he has a mind of his own. I haven't always agreed with him on anything, on everything, but I, <laughs> al <laughs> I, I always am interested in hearing what he has to say because I think it gives all of us something, something to think about. He has done a very good job heading the negotiation subcommittee as well as, as the policy subcommittee and whatever other ones he's done. So I just want him to know that we will miss <clears throat> him greatly. Um, he's very even-tempered. He is very clear in what he believes. And he certainly represents for me what I think a good school committee member should be. Thank you, Barbara. We will miss you. Uh, yes, Jennifer. So I don't know how I'm going to follow Barbara's words, Michael. That was that was pretty good. Um, but I, I will miss having you on school committee, and I really appreciate working with you on school committee and especially on policy subcommittee. Um, I've learned a great deal about policy from working with you and the, the fine line between policy and procedure. And so um, I really do appreciate working with you. and. Um, I will uh, see you around at town meeting, um, but I will miss seeing you at school. So I thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, 
I guess Suzanne and then Helen. Yeah, I, can you hear me? I'm having trouble with my, can, can you hear me? It's very yeah. quiet. You have to speak loud. Wow. Okay. I'll try. I'm yelling. Um, so, I'm, Michael, I don't mean to yell at you, <laughs> <laughs> but I have to say, Michael, when, when Michael speaks, we all listen because we know that you've been very thoughtful about what's coming and uh, you are uh, very deliberate in what you share with us and how, and how you present. And that's really quite refreshing and uh, always welcome. So your voice will really be missed. And uh, I learned a little bit about negotiation serving with you this year. That is a really tough job and a tough subcommittee. So thank you, especially for all your efforts on uh, the contract work you've done in the past. And, and you will be missed. I will miss you. I will miss you as well. Thank you, Suzanne. Hi, Helen. Hi, Michael. I, I'm going to miss you greatly on the school committee. I agree with everything everybody else said, so I won't repeat all that. But uh, I think Michael's calm demeanor and ability to really think about issues in ways, in many multiple ways, has, has served us very well on the school committee. Um, I'm just, I'm really sorry you're leaving. I'm almost thinking maybe we just don't accept your resignation, you know? <laughs> I try. You might want to resign, but maybe we don't accept it. <laughs> thank you, Michael. And thank your family for all the time and effort you've put into this because they deserve it. Totally. Thank you. Susan? So I too am in denial. Um, and normally these are a roast, just so we're really clear. We don't say nice things. So, and humor doesn't always translate on video. So, you know, but I will miss, you know, the you swear like a sailor. Um, and I think that's going to miss that. I'm going to miss your temper tantrums when you just start like yelling at people. Um, I'm going to miss it when you start slamming stuff down on the, on the table and we all just kind of like start startle a little bit. Um, I mean, I, the one thing that I have been truly impressed with, besides your just, you know, legal mind, is how you always ask about the kids. Like, that's your question. That's your lens. And it's always been your lens. Um, and I remember one of the very first things you said, we, I said, how's school committee going for you after your first year? And you said, you know what? Like, I thought we were going to be talking about the kids a lot more. <laughs> um, we talked about a lot of things, a lot of policies and and procedures and and stuff, right? And but like we don't get to talk about kids that much. Um, and I think that that really um, it, re it resonated for me. And I do think that um, over the course of this, just how you have always tied the work you're doing to the impact on the classroom, the impact on kids, that's really important to me. Um, and and I really appreciate that about your voice. Um, and I will miss it. I'll miss it. I'll miss her as well. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> I like to say, Michael, that I uh, really appreciate your organizational skills. I remember serving with you on the superintendent search committee. You ran that extremely well. I thought it was seamless. It went great. It was one of my best subcommittee experiences. Uh, I also want to dovetail off something that uh, Suzanne mentioned, that everyone pays attention when you speak. Now, part of that is in the full committee meetings, you can sometimes be a man of few words, but those words carry a lot of weight precisely because if you are speaking, it's probably something very important. So people pay attention. So thank you very much for your service. No problem. There's value in scarcity. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> and brevity as well, right? Um, now I wanted to open it up. Yes, Ben, is there anyone who I had said, I didn't mean to exclude by asking if school, just if school committee members were wanting to say something. So Ben, thank you. Yes. Yeah. Sure. So I'll, I'll do my best uh, in a, at a time when I'm not feeling very articulate. I'll do my best to speak for the superintendents you, you serve serve with. I think all of, all of whom I know and worked with. But um, Michael, uh, both in my prior role and as superintendent, I've appreciated um, your your being well reasoned and reasonable um, and uh, very thoughtful um, to the point. Um, and also really understanding, um, I think you've always really shown great respect for our, our educators. And I, I mean that broad brush. I mean the, the leaders in central office who you work closely with, our school leaders, our teachers, our educators, um, 
And you've shown that in a variety of ways, often asking what we or, or my colleagues, you know, feel or believe or what's our, what's our um, uh, guidance on it, but also in understanding uh, the various roles that, that we play and you play. And, um, and that distinction has always been helpful, I think, to, been helpful to me as a superintendent, and I think other superintendents, superintendents as well. Um, and I think also what I'll miss is um, your steadiness. And I mean that in, in, in with deep respect um, in terms of uh, being there, um, being there in difficult times, taking on very difficult roles, but always um, knowing what we, we can expect from you. Um, and that in, in a, in a field or business that can have a lot, quite a bit of turmoil, that steadiness is um, a, a tremendous asset and a tremendous benefit to folks in my role and my colleagues. So thank you. Thank you, Beth. Great. So I, you know, I just, I just wanted to add one, a few other things is just, I really always appreciated um, everyone who serves on school committee with small children. And it's incredibly hard, school committee's hard. It's incredibly hard to do when you're working. It's incredibly hard to do when you have kids. And just to echo the thanks to your family and to thanks to the girls who have sat outside um, in the hallway at subcommittee meetings and have attended meetings and you know, to your wife who has done pass off with the kids coming, coming and her picking them up from meetings to bring them home, to worry about dinner and homework. And it's so important. It's so important to have different voices and voices of children at different ages and voices of um, individuals who have already had children have gone through the system or might come through the system in the future, which is so incredibly important. And I just want to take you know, a minute to acknowledge how hard it is to do. Um, and, but you still, you know, you still did it and you still pushed through. Uh, and to thank you for that and to thank you for for your kids for that huge sacrifice that they made to let you know to enable you to do that um and also to you know i think i've learned two two really great things from you i always try to kind of pull from working with with everyone something and you know two of the things that i have learned from you is is what a lot of people have said you're just your steadiness and i think that you're um you know sometimes i kind of come out all guns a blazing and you know, you don't, you don't swing at every pitch. And that's something that's really, it's important and it's really great, especially on a committee when we have lots of voices and lots of different issues. You know, you pick the things that you really passionately care about and those are the things that you, uh, you lean in on and vo voice your opinion. And so that's something that I, that I have pulled from watching you uh, and that I appreciate. And the other is um, to say no when you can't, when there's something that's beyond your capacity to take on, uh, to say, you know, I would love to, to be able to do that. I'm going to have to say no this time. And that's a skill that I lack often. Um, and, and I appreciate and uh, have appreciated that you have felt comfortable saying that at different times throughout. I also very much appreciate those times that you said no initially. And then especially, you know, sometimes this year, uh, let me convince you uh, to to do it anyways, even though um, you didn't have the capacity and bandwidth. And I really appreciate all of the sacrifice and hard work that you have put in um, this year uh, while I was chair and in all of those years before. So thank you. Um, you know, I, I did, if there were a way that I could not, if we could not accept Michael's resignation, I would have pushed back as this is another time to say no. Um, unfortunately, I looked into it and he submits his letter to the clerk, not to the chair of the school committee. And so he's done that. So it's not not for me to accept or not accept. But please, Michael, know that all of us will miss you dearly and have really, really appreciated um, working with you and getting to know you. And we look forward to, to, to remaining friends after this as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so thank you. Thank you all for for such nice words. I wasn't, um, I, I thought one of the benefits of doing this during a pandemic was that you could avoid, um, you know, sort of the, the round rob you know, of, of, of discussion, but um, but there, there were such lovely words and, and I really do appreciate them. Um, Susan, thank you for sticking to uh, our policy on, on gross um, uh, 
uh, you really hit the nail on the head, probably more so than anyone else. Uh, I think I think everybody else hit the what what the public sees, um, and you you hit what uh, sometimes is seen uh, in other um, in other envir environments, um, the swearing, the temper tantrums, etc. Um, I have I have really I've enjoyed my time on on school committee. It's it's been a really um, it's been an amazing experience. It's been way more challenging than um, I thought it was ever going to be. Um, and I think it's evolved that way to some degree over the six years that I've been uh, here on school committee. It's um, there's just so many more demands now um, on school committee members and it's and it's difficult to, to do. Um, and but one of the things that's really made it um, uh, doable for me to the extent that I can do, I was able to do it over the last six years was uh, the support that um, that the other committee members and the staff and, and everyone else um, uh, gives to me and the other school committee members. Uh, it, it really is a great group of people and it really does make um, make it easier to try to figure out how to, to do all of the things that we need to do as members of, of the school committee. So. Um, I, I really am thankful for that, and, I, and I'm thankful for meeting so many great, be, having the opportunity to meet so many great people um, who I consider friends uh, and not just colleagues on the school committee. It is, it is a great group, and I really love that. Um, uh, you know, I, I considered, I consider trying to stay on until the until the next election. Um, I, it, it, it's been challenging for me in the last um, six months or so between family, my growing children. By increasing work responsibilities, um, increasing responsibilities with school committee. Uh, as some of you know, I had a, a, a house issue this year that I'm still in a construction project, or I'm actually not in the construction project. I'm actually, what you're seeing behind me is the temporary apartment that I'm living in um, and sort of managing that that process, which is wrapping up over the next couple of months or next month or so and moving back into my place. All those things together, um, uh, Signal to me that it was that I really needed to, to sort of make this move now, uh, and that's that's just some of the reason why I'm doing it. So it's um, it, it's, but like I've said, it's it's um, I, I couldn't have I couldn't have asked for a more educational experience um, out of this, and um, I look forward to seeing all of you in other capacities in the near future. Thank you, thank you, Michael. All right, so we will we will go into the next part of our meeting, which is an update on the school closing in response to COVID-19. Uh, ben, are you going to get us? Are you doing the framework or are we going to jump right uh, in with Ms. No Miller? I'll, I'll just give a, a quick overview of what we're going to do tonight. Um, we're going to start with, uh, well, first of all, I just want to say one more time to all our staff, all our colleagues, um, all our families, uh, first, let's thank you. This is an incredibly uh, daunting time. Uh, it is uh, overwhelming on so many levels for families, for, for children, for our staff, for school committee members, um, even for a superintendent. Uh, but folks are working really hard. And as I continue to say, and as principals keep on telling me, um, you know, we continue to get better at this. Uh, it is something that we could never be prepared for. Um, it's not the work we do. You know, we are in this business, in this work because, you know, our educators, our paraprofessionals, our school secretaries, our school leaders, our vice principals, our ETFs, our ETSs, all of our folks um, are there to be with our children and our students, to work with them closely uh, in very personal and deep ways. And uh, that's really been taken away from all of us in so many ways. Um, what you'll hear tonight is um, just as we're trying to give you uh, updates, you, the committee, but also the community updates on, on uh, what's happening in our, in our schools. Um, we're gonna start with um, some work, uh, some folks who Casey you know, Miller has pulled together uh, on special education related services to tell you uh, from their perspective, how things are going and the work, the great work they're doing and the great work they represent from so many people in the district. And then we'll move on to a couple of principles uh, Dr. Issa Savellius from the Heat School and Lor uh, Leslie Ryan Miller from the Pierce School to give us perspective uh, from school leaders um, and all the work that uh, their staff are doing. And then we'll uh, close the update uh, by looking at some of the um, financial uh, 
um, uh, numbers and costs. I'm sorry, where am I missing one thing? A very important update from Dr. Gittins about the um, work that's happening on our common um, uh, learning expectations and then the work of the task force as well. So um, uh, some great important updates from some fantastic people who are doing great work for our students and our staff. And so I'll hand it off to uh, Casey No Miller to introduce the folks who are going to give us an update on special education. Great. Thanks, Ben. Good evening, everyone. Um, since I last spoke to the committee, um, special education staff and administrators have taken uh, more steps to strengthening our remote learning um, to students receiving services via special education. I'll keep uh, my update brief because we do have uh, folks who can speak um, really who are on the ground working with students to speak to the great work that they have been doing and continuing um, to add to. But since I last um, spoke with the committee, um, what the directors and I um, have been encouraging folks to do more of is to increase face time with students overall um, and um, continuing to add more small group instruction um, and where appropriate uh, more one-to-one -one services to students uh, where they may not have been. Um, thank you to um, the executive board of uh, CPAC, in particular Faith Dantowitz and Linda Monach um, and the families who have reached out to give me um, and my team feedback on what's working and what's not working. Um, as a result of that, we have a, a, a much more comprehensive picture um, in terms of what is working well and what we need to pay more attention to. Um, we are seeing some inconsistencies uh, among providers um, in terms of FaceTime with students. Of course, there are many variables that play into that um, some students require more face time while some um, do not um, and are accessing what's being um, presented and provided uh, fine. And then there are some who we really need to do more for. Um, so we are able to hone in on um, what those areas are and are working towards that. I know last time I spoke, there was some question about speech and language services. I was able to meet with all of the SLPs in the district on Tuesday during their um, regular meeting and learned a bit more um, in terms of direct speech services and where we are um, now that we know that this closure is um, uh, through the end of the school year. Um, we as a team do need to pivot a bit and focus more on um, what's that next level of service that we need to begin to provide service, um, uh, more support for students and um, for speech. Um, it is teleservice, teletherapy, you know, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and there are some hurdles that we do need to cross. Um, a main one being the appropriate PD that the um, State Board of uh, Registration for Allied Health requires uh, that folks receive. Um, so we are identifying some providers so that our SLPs do get that training so that we can get started sooner rather than later. But because there will be some um, time uh, to get things settled, uh, we are also looking to contract with an agency um, that provides telehealth regularly um, to get started with some students who um, we are more concerned about in terms of losing skills. Um, I will pause there so that I can have um, my colleagues start um, speaking a little bit to the great work that they have been doing themselves um, and uh, been doing with their colleagues. And I will also ask um, the superintendent to mute if possible. Sorry, I hope I wasn't That's Okay. <laughs> great. Thank you, Superintendent. So I will start with um, Mrs. Carolyn McCarthy, who is the educational team facilitator at Peer School, to speak a little bit about her work um, at Pierce, and then we'll um, keep going with the line of folks who have been so patiently waiting uh, to speak with the committee. So Carrie Lynn, I will hand it off to you. Thank you, Casey. Good evening, everyone. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, I am the ETF at Pierce School, and some of the work that I've been really um, doing at Pierce has been 
really providing support to my special ed staff, uh, really rolling out the phases each week with them, meeting weekly uh, for PSS meetings. And I'm proud to say we are now doing all online IEP meetings as of uh, two weeks ago. And uh, the feeling around that from families has been very positive. So it's great to connect with families. I haven't seen in a while. It's been really, really good. Um, so some of the work that we've been doing at Pierce is a lot of our work has really been um, synchronous, engaging students in real time on set schedules and times provided through uh, every, every student has a Google folder with IEP specific related goal sections and our service providers are adding that work weekly. Our liaison is really in charge of um, getting in touch with the families and providing those folders each week. Um, it was just getting overwhelming for a lot of the families to be receiving so many emails from so many people. And that was a clear way that we could work together to provide that information. Staff are currently providing at least half of child service delivery needs. So for example, if a speech and language student receives one session a week for 30 minutes, we are providing at least 15 minutes a week of that time. And that can be done in multiple platforms in multiple ways. I have to be honest, a lot of our staff are getting um, their direction directly from the families. So some families will say it's really hard for us to do um, synchronous learning in real time. Is there a way that you can do pre-recorded lessons and activities? And so we, some of our uh, SLPs have websites that they are sending where they're pre-recorded activities. Some of our uh, providers are setting up weekly Zoom meetings and check-ins, virtual check-ins, emails. All service providers are consulting weekly with both general ed staff and special ed staff as listed in their grid A IEP service delivery. They're joining grade level group meets um, just to help provide those services in the classroom, especially for our students that require that support for in-class support. And then finally, um, the new learning that's really coming out is uh, the platforms of new learning. So if we have a teacher who is working on um, special ed, uh, let's say she's working on a reading lesson, she's providing that new learning through an accessible platform that's really been determined by the families. So I know our goal is really to work together to provide one platform and honestly, it's really depended on the needs of the families. So I just wanna say, I think we're doing extraordinary work in extraordinary times. And I'm proud to say that I work in Brooklyn. Thank you, Carrie Lynn. Um, we're gonna move next to um, Ms. Rebecca Snyder, who is our guidance counselor um, at Runkle. Rebecca, whenever you're ready. I'm ready. Um, thank you all for having me. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about all the work that's being done. Um, I can speak specifically to Runkle, but um, among guidance counselors across the district, um, the number one goal for us is to stay connected with students. Um, so students that um, maybe we met with individually, we are meeting through telehealth. Um, we, um, as you know, as general education, uh, we, I, I at least, I know that um, it looks different in different schools, but I join um, my fifth grades. I, I cover grades five through eight. I join fifth grade weekly meetings. Um, sometimes I'll lead an activity. Um, I also have um, set up advisories for six through eight. So every week, sixth graders meet with their homeroom. Seventh graders get mixed up based on um, whatever class I choose that, that day. Um, we'll have three meetings in a row and the teacher is always present for seventh and eighth. And um, it's been really great for certainly for me to see kids' faces and to hear from them and doing a lot of check-ins on how they're doing socially and emotionally. And I think at this point, they're sort of 
in the groove a little bit and are okay just to see each other and play games. Um, but that's happening on a weekly basis. I have interns that are offering um, drop-in groups for students, um, interns also seeing the students that they had seen um, all year. And um, so we're working really hard, I think, in terms of staying connected with students. Um, and I feel also really proud of it and really lucky that we have these tools to be able to stay connected with students. Um, just one other piece is, um, at least in my role, is, and it might just be the way my brain works, but um, systems are really important to me and structures. And um, one of the things that we've done is create um, a spreadsheet, at least in middle school for six through eight, um, checking in which students maybe we're not hearing from. Um, and if there are students that have not, you know, appeared in any of the advisories or ever, any of the teacher meetings or are not doing any of the work, um, then teachers reach out directly. And then if they still don't have much luck, then I re reach out to the families. Um, and I've, I've been pretty successful with that, not necessarily uh, successful in terms of getting the students to be everywhere they're asked to be, but, um, but at least being able to check in with families and know that they're okay. Um, if there are students that um, teachers, I mean, generally the, line, the, the way that it works is teachers make note if a student isn't present or they haven't heard from a student and they, um, they try to reach out first and then they alert the guidance counselors. Um, and we may also share that information with, with Maria, um, particularly if we're struggling with reaching students. But um, I think for the most part, there's also been a lot of, you know, sort of general communication with families that guidance counselors have been doing, um, sending out letters, maybe weekly or biweekly, just checking in. Um, and I think the response has been really positive. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, next up, I do have uh, a number of high school folks who will speak to the work that they are doing. But before that, I'll just pause and ask if um, the committee has any questions. I also have Maria Litas on um, the line too, if folks have any questions about uh, district-wide guidance supports, but any questions for Carrie Lynn um, or, and or Rebecca? Yeah, it's just uh, regarding the presentation we had about services being offered at uh, Pierce School. Is that Pierce model also being replicated across the district and the other K-8 schools? And, so, and a second question I have, uh, you, there was a discussion of uh, platforms that the faculty and the staff have been putting together. Do parents also have access to that or is that staff only? So I can speak to your um, first question. Um, it does look different um, at each of the schools, but overall what Carrie Lynn described um, is what is occurring at the other uh, K to eights. And then is your second question, did Carolyn speak to a platform? Is that what you're asking about? Yes. So this, are you talking about the systems that, that I was talking about creating? Yeah, so I, um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so um, every time like a calendar or anything is created for students, I post that on my Google Guidance Google Classroom page, and I also share it with parents. Um, so we've created a schedule of the weekly meetings that parents get as well as students. So um, all the communication, at least the general communication, is given to parents as well. So, great, and, oh, go ahead. I have a, a just a, a comment because I'm really, uh, Rebecca, I want to thank you for how you've set up checking in on students. I think that's critical as one of my fears that there would be kids who would just sort of disappear, you know, and we wouldn't know what's happening with them. And I'm hoping that what you're doing is being done at the other schools and in the other grades. Um, that that I don't know, but I'm, I'm very thankful for, for what you described because these are difficult times and it's important. It may be something as simple as they don't have internet access, or it may be something much more complicated. But. I mean, I can say that um, in our guidance counselor meetings every week, 
everybody, this is everybody's priority is making sure nobody slips through the cracks and that everybody has access and everybody has everything that they need. Um, and even like, in, like as a guidance counselor, I work with a team of people. So it may be identified um, by a teacher or by me, but there also might be other people that have relationships with the family that might be better, um, the better people to reach out or even another family, a neighbor, you know, we've been pretty creative in terms of like, if we don't hear from somebody just saying, hey, you know, can you call them or text them and just see how they're doing? Um, so, you know, it's, it's really crazy times and we're doing everything we can and Probably, I'm probably breaking some rules in terms of giving my cell phone number out to people, but you know, it's it's it works. You do and what you have to do. <laughs> you do what you have to do, and it's working. And um, yeah, thanks. Thank you, Rebecca. I do want to um, just have Maria speak a little bit to Helen's question about um, if this is occurring across all of the schools. And I know high school will speak to that once we get there. But Maria, if you can speak a little bit in terms of what the K-8s are doing to reach students who have been harder to reach. Absolutely. So this is occurring across the district at all of the schools. Um, generally in the same fashion where there's a tracking system to ensure that we are um, connecting with all students in some capacity. And then um, in addition to that, if, if we are having low contact, who is reaching out, just ensuring that we are understanding what the challenges are for that particular family, and then what supports that we can provide, um, what we can do um, to just, you know, uh, personally support them, whether that is, um, you know, challenges with um, uh, internet connectivity, um, you know, there some families might have um, illness in the family. For, uh, many parents are still working. So really just trying to understand and support families um, in that respect. Um, and also, as Re Rebecca mentioned, um, there are so many people that are interacting, ensuring that we're all communicating, um, because that's another priority to uh, support not only the students, but um, staff members as well. Thanks, Maria. Um, I am going to. Suzanne, uh, did you? Oh, oh, yes, to, sorry. Yeah, yeah, if you don't mind. Um, so I know that Bridge, which is a, a group of concerned citizens around racial equity in town in our schools, uh, is uh, sent a letter to all of us. And, and there are some concerns around equity and uh, making sure all our students get the, the best that they can get. And I'm wondering if um, perhaps police might come at our next meeting and give us an update and perhaps very specifically asking our METCO folks and our Steps to Success people uh, about their challenges in particular around equity and how we are addressing that. So I may not have that answer tonight, but I'm, I'm thinking it would be good to look into that as well and specifically yep. So Suzanne, we're ha happy to, to schedule that for the next update. We were also thinking of a of a BHS update, a more, you know, more complete one. Um, so I think that um, those two combined would be would be help very helpful for the community. Both one is really focusing on on equity, then also on BHS. So we'll make sure when we go through the docket, we plan that out. Thank you. Thank you. And then certainly other folks, if you want to speak to that tonight, of course you're welcome to. Thanks, Ben. Um, so I'm going to ask Ms. Wendy Ryder to come on. Wendy, I know you're having some connectivity issues. Can you hear me? Okay, I'm going to pivot real quick just in the interest of time. I'm here. I'm oh, you here. are? Okay. Yep, sorry. Um, so I just want to begin by saying how much gratitude I have for the special education high school. They're a skilled and talented group, and during this unprecedented and really difficult time. Their diligence and tenacity and persistence in trying to connect with students and engage them in work. It's been amazing and I'm honored to be uh, working alongside them. At the high school, we, as you are aware, we have a wide range of students with disabilities, severe to moderate, a variety of settings, many sub-separate to partial and inclusion um, settings. And our first priority during this remote learning time has been really to connect with students and engage them in the relationships that have been so important when we're in session. Because at the high school, oftentimes, and probably at the K-8s, it's the relationship 
with the special educators that motivate them to come to school to engage and access the work. And so that's been our, I would say, our first priority. Um, tonight, you'll hear from an array of uh, my colleagues that service students in a variety of these settings and different student populations. So just generally and briefly, at the high school, we approach special education services in a team model, and we've continued that during uh, this remote learning environment. So what that looks like is the teachers and all the related service providers, speech, OT, PT, even if they only service one student in the program, we're all meeting with myself and the coordinators weekly to collaborate on student engagement, social emotional resilience, and academic participation. Um, and so that in that model, um, the teachers and the related service providers are providing student directed activities as well as instruction in small group in, the, in a classroom model setting through Zoom or Google Meets um, or as appropriate individually. Along with that are related service providers, um, which at the high school are, typic are typically so speech and language pathologists or counselors. Um, we'll go into the classrooms or the learning centers to work with students and the teachers and the paraprofessionals to generalize the skills that they're working on with students in the small groups or sub separate. And then just to comment on our students who are in the inclusion settings, uh, as you can imagine, our high schoolers are waking up at 10 o'clock and that's early for them. Many of them are getting up at 12, 3. Today I heard that students are waking up at 5 and asking to have services at 8 o'clock at night with their learning center teachers. And so a large part of the work that the educators and related services providers are doing is really executive functioning first to help students really structure their day, their time, and their work. And then um, the related service providers in those inclusion settings will use the academics assignments as a conduit to their services, which is what we do during the school, when school is in session, and they're continuing with that model of services. Um, but without any further ado, I would like to hand the floor over to my esteemed colleagues, beginning with Haley Wells, who is a co-teacher and small group teacher at um, OLS. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Haley Wells. And like Wendy said, uh, so I co-teach geometry um, in ninth grade at OLS. And um, Indra Ong, who's right next to me here, um, we're roommates, by the way, so we are appropriately <laughs> socially distant here. Um, we teach a racial awareness course together outside of special ed. Um, so like Haley said, I'm Indra Ong. Um, in addition to that racial awareness course, I also co-teach sophomore English, um, as well as provide reading services for students with reading goals. So we're just gonna kind of tag team and share um, some of what's going on um, in our world. Um, and so thank you for giving us this opportunity to talk to you and for listening to us. Um, so in terms of student directed elements that are being implemented um, by my colleagues and me um, is various forms of scaffolded differentiated work um, provided by the teacher to be completed by the student. Um, this work looks really different and comes in a variety of forms. So it could be um, links to tutorial videos, either that we ourselves are making to help the kids get through it or general online resources. So like in math, Khan Academy, Delta Math, things like that. Um, we are also providing within the um, tasks or directions, completed examples, model problems, um, in terms of our kids who read and comprehension um, or general, just like executive function of organi organizing what's on the page. Um, we offer either written directions or some teachers are doing like video overviews of the tasks um, to kind of give a little bit of that in-person feel of us being there. Um, we also, like this week for math specifically, we've created individualized catch-up plans for students who are not on track to earn credit. Um, and we also are providing alternate assessments when necessary um, for either certain student 
uh, general populations or specialized programs or on like an as needed individual basis. Um, within the tasks that we are providing for students, uh, we are doing our best to offer menus of options with different types of tasks uh, and also level of challenge um, to kind of meet student choice and accessibility where students are at. Um, so some of the types of tasks we're doing uh, readings, online activities, uh, watching videos and responding to videos, discussion boards uh, where kids can interact with each other and we can chime in and facilitate as necessary. Um, problems where they're in math, like actually doing the problems out and uploading their work for us to see or in other classes, you know, like written responses, paragraphs, papers, whatever it may be. Um, and also a larger focus for us too during this time has been on mind, including mindfulness activities. Uh, so mindful art has been super popular. Um, going like asking students to go for if their parents will allow like a socially distant walk um, for mindfulness, gratitude practices, those kinds of things. Um, so that's kind of like the student piece. And then um, in terms of collaboration um, that we are doing um, the between the district and uh, high school administration, we've kind of put together some common practices, like when work is released to children, when the due dates are, um, you know, certain platforms to use, what the grading expectations are, things like that. Um, and also in terms of collaboration, we are attending many, many meetings, uh, sometimes weekly, bi-weekly, sometimes a few times a week, depending on the need. Um, so sometimes like in special ed department meetings, we're meeting with job alike um, colleagues. So like learning center teachers, co-teachers, things like that. Uh, we're also meeting in grade or subject teams. So like ninth grade math meets a few times a week to think about our work. Um, full department meetings, full faculty meetings. Um, so all types of ways to try to meet together and collaborate. And then in addition to all of those meetings that Haley just mentioned, um, we are consistently emailing with families, uh, students, teams, so teachers, support staff, um, and we're doing that on a daily basis. We're messaging through Canvas, we're using the PSBMA accounts, um, and we're also messaging through the United Mind Workers website that is up. Um, so teachers are regularly updating all of those, um, those forums. And we are also doing a lot, like Haley mentioned earlier, we're doing a lot with Zoom and other video conferencing platforms. So things like Google Meetup or Google Hangouts. Um, myself and other colleagues are offering open office hours several times a week. So we have a set time. Um, students are able to set this down in their agenda book and know that from like Tuesdays, four to five, I can go see Ms. Ong. Um, and we're using these meetings in a couple different ways. So they're optional, but we hope to um, first and foremost, just establish and maintain connections with students, um, offer academic support, and then also continue to do social emotional check-ins and make sure that everyone's doing okay, um, find out more about families and what, what the home situation is. And then um, we're able to use that information and that data to report out to student teams and provide support as needed. Um, another model that we're using in addition to these open office hours are that we are also offering um, as appropriate, we're offering small group um, sections and also um, on a case to case basis, we're offering some one on one support. And so these are really meant to be targeted sessions in which we're focusing in on students IEP goals, um, continuing to build those skills and help develop um, skills that they can carry and apply throughout all of their different uh, tasks. Um, we like Wendy Ryder mentioned one of the biggest obstacles that we're up against um, is students' executive functioning. <laughs> and so um, we're doing a lot of work to just help students navigate um, not only creating a schedule and keeping track of due dates and things like that, but also just how do I access this, um, this file on Canvas or how do I set up this Zoom meeting that I need to have with a teacher. So we're helping run a lot of um, interference on those logistical pieces. Um, and I think we have 
been able to get in touch with a good number of students. I've definitely been pleasantly surprised by the amount of students that I'm consistently hearing from and getting work from. Um, so that has been a blessing. Of course, um, there are some students that we are missing and those are the ones that are on our radar. We're definitely tracking to see who has been in contact with who. Um, and as soon as we see, you know, a name pop up a couple times, like it's all hands on deck and just doing whatever we can. Um, like Rebecca was saying, you know, whether it's calling or getting inventive and, and asking to text a neighbor, like we're doing whatever we can to circle around our kids. All right. Thank you so much, Indra Hong and Haley Wells. That was a wonderful, comprehensive overview of what's happening in the inclusion and partial inclusion setting. We really appreciate you being here. So next, I'm going to introduce Dr. Matt Dubois, who is our school psychologist and works in the Supported Learning Center. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, having me here tonight. Um, as uh, Wendy uh, said, my, my primary role um, at the high school is I help uh, coordinate a program called the Supported Learning Center. Um, and in, in SLC, we serve, uh, right now we have 24 students in the program. Uh, we have myself as a psychologist, we have a special education teacher, uh, we have two paraprofessionals and two interns. Um, and the, the, one of the active ingredients, I would say, of SLC, um, uh, based on the needs of our students, is really facilitating strong relationships uh, with kids. Um, the way that our program is built is that we typically will see kids multiple times every single day. So for our seniors, that's been four years of, of, of seeing us multiple times every single day throughout their high school uh, career. Um, so what we've definitely tried to do during this period is to remain uh, engaged with our kids um, and, and to keep that uh, going for them. And so what we uh, have uh, right now is our setup um, and uh, Indra and Wendy sort of both reference this is our Mondays, we, we typically are our executive functioning days for our kids. Um, and so as much as we're able to, we'll set up individual meetings with kids where we'll get them organized for the week. Um, that typically would be with myself or, or with their uh, liaison. Um, it'll go into United Mind Workers, we'll go into Canvas, and we'll develop an academic plan for the week. On uh, Tuesdays through Thursdays, um, we have kids uh, join a group Zoom. Um, it's usually uh, about five kids uh, per group Zoom, and they're on there for an hour. Um, with myself, uh, my, my special education teacher, and two paraprofessionals. Um, and uh, we, for, for kids that don't need support, we'll actually just have them sort of mute themselves and sort of remain with us while they do work. Uh, we've learned that if kids are not supervised, they're very good at avoiding during this period, so not a lot of work will, will get done. Um, and then we use the breakout uh, uh, function pretty heavily within Zoom to get one-on-one -on -one support uh, for kids. Um, they, and then on Fridays, if there's any remaining work, we'll do another individual uh, session uh, with kids. Uh, kids also meet with me individually for therapy every single week. Um, and on uh, Wednesdays, we do a program-wide meeting, uh, which is typically more community-based. We usually do a fun uh, activity uh, for the past couple of weeks. Uh, we've done uh, trivia. Uh, so um, again, sort of what we're really uh, focusing on based on the needs of our kids um, are, is on the social emotional aspect. Um, and, and a part of our work has always been with kids and continues to be is around advocating uh, for their needs, uh, both uh, uh, with their families and also with teachers. So it's pretty common for us to reach out to uh, the classroom teachers of all of our kids and just they give them a heads up about what's going on uh, within their lives and to make sure that their accommodations uh, continue to be followed uh, during this time. Thank you, Dr. Dubois. Um, you, Dr. Dubois also supports um, Winthrop House. He's on our crisis team. He's the lead of our early warning data system. So he, we use his talents in a variety of ways. Thank you. And lastly, I'd like to introduce Elaine Shields. She is our teacher for Bridge Alliance, which is our program for 18 to 22 year olds. Hi, I'm Elaine. Hi. Um, so I teach the bridge program, which Wendy mentioned, we're community based. Um, we serve students ages 18 to 22 with, with moderate to severe disabilities. So our typical day pre the COVID crisis um, was, you know, typically we'd be out in the community for about 60% of the day um, doing 
life skill development, vocational training, working at internships, traveling on the train, that type of thing. So our day looks very different now, obviously. Um, luckily, we have had success with using Zoom for classes. So we meet three times a week over Zoom for about 45 minutes. And um, we have about 100% attendance nearly every class, which has been really wonderful. Um, we have seven students this year and six paraprofessionals. So it's the 14 of us that meet three times a week. Um, and then after class, I set up the breakout rooms um, via Zoom and that allows our staff to work one-to-one -one with students. So each student is getting two to three sessions a week, one-to-one -one with either a peer professional or myself. Um, also, every student has an individualized learning plan and we've been creating or finding online materials for each of the students and dropping them into the students' Google Drive folders. Uh, also, our service providers all take turns dropping into our classes, which has been really nice. So that means our occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech and language pathologists, um, BCPA, all of the above. Everyone's been joining into our classes. Um, we even had Mona, our, um, one of the front desk staff at OLS, join a class the other day, which was fun. And then two of my male colleagues, uh, Jim Henry and Brenda McCarthy, teach a weekly men's group to my students. And additionally, I collaborate weekly with Wendy Ryder and our team of service providers, which has been really impactful. Um, and then I communicate frequently with all the students, all their families. Um, and I think it's been pretty successful actually. And I'm, I think I'm mainly grateful for Wendy's support and for having a strong team. Um, oh, also Anthony, I'm, I'm really grateful for Anthony because he actually went and personally, um, picked up something we needed from the classroom and delivered it to one of my students personally. So that was really nice. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening to me talk about Bridge. So thank you, uh, my high school team of representatives of the, uh, of the special education department. Um, and I think that you have all shared with school committee the range of services and, and, uh, uh, and instructional practices that we're doing during this remote learning time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, Haley, Indra, Elaine. Casey, do you have opportunity for questions if there are questions from school committee members? Let's take let's take a few definitely. Um, and then we do want to move on. I, we, we're trying to keep on track on our time and also other, other folks' time, but I think if we can have a, have a few and then love to really hear from Principal Savellis and Principal Ryan Miller. Does anyone have any questions? Susan? Yeah, so first of all, I just wanna echo, it sounds like there's so much activity going on and it's just so obvious that you guys care about the kids so much. It just, you exude it, um, you know, and even being up on this call late tonight when you've got full days. So thank you for being here. Thank you for the work you're doing. Um, it is, it's hard work. Um, it's hard work in good days um, and, it's, and it's really challenging now. So thank you for that. Um, it just, it's, um, it's so heartwarming to hear. Um, I guess my question is, as we think about the you know, sort of district wide, um, how do, what is the, what is your recommendation for how we can kind of get our hands around, you know, a snapshot of how the district is, how, how our kids are doing? Um, so for example, you know, I get asked questions like, you know, do we, you know, do we know how many parents are struggling, you know, and are we, you know, are, are we providing supports for the kids um, and we're connecting them to resources? And I say, I'm, totally comfortable saying, yes, that's happening. Um, I think it's just not, it's not clear to me, is that happening to 10% of our kids? Is that happened to 30% of our kids? Like just how do we get our heads around um, how kids are doing emotionally? Like, are they even in a place where they where learning is something that they can be doing? Um, and they might not be. Um, if they aren't in that place, how are we kind of keeping track of, you know, the kinds of things that they're not only needing in terms of resources, but also, you know, what they're missing, right? Especially if they're, you know, IEPs that are, you know, they're, they're not, um, services they're not getting for whatever reason. And, um, you know, how do we, just how are we keeping track of that? And then I guess sort of on the flip side, if there are places where things that we're doing are working really well, 
like how, how are we kind of gathering that to say, you know what, this is working really well. We want to kind of be doing more of it and, and be getting that kind of feedback loop. Um, Cause I think again, it's, it's easy to kind of hear the individual stories and understand kind of the multimodal approaches you're using and how you're kind of swinging into action. Um, it's just really hard at a system level to kind of pull back and, and see how we're, how our kids are doing as a system. Cause I think it'll be really important for us to know if, 5% of our kids are really, really struggling and can't access materials, so don't even bother. That's a different number than if it's like 40%, right? Or so I just, I think we would make different decisions. And so I guess I'm just trying to, hopefully this makes sense as a question, but I'm just yeah. trying to get at how do we at a system level or maybe, you know, either Leslie or some of the other printer or Asa, um, how do you guys at a building level just get a snapshot of where where the kids and the families are. So I think that's just what I'm struggling with. Uh, but you know, the the these stories are very are very helpful just to give us some concrete ideas. So I Susan, can... I'll just jump in really quickly. Um, in terms of your systems question um, and the feed feedback loop, um, this is exactly what happens during the OSS admin meetings where folks speak from. Um, they report out essentially in terms of what's working and not working at the schools that they oversee, um, and where systems are working. We are, you know, we look to codify it elsewhere um, in terms of how we know whether or not our students are doing well. Um, one thing that um, Aaron Cooley, who's the uh, director of data management, and I met with uh, some members of OTL too to think about a survey to go out to parents, uh, both Gen Ed with the focus to on special ed to find out are you accessing the services? Why? Why not? Um, uh, you know, do you have any concerns about your students learning? So we're hoping to get something um, designed um, and out there sooner rather than later. Um, I do, uh, I'll, I'm actually going to ask Matt um, and Maria to speak a little bit about um, how you know whether or not, how, how you know uh, uh, students are doing social emotionally. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Susan, super, super important. Um, one thing, and this is a similar thing, I think it was happening a lot of the elementary schools. We have a, we have a tracker at the high school that one piece of data that that um, uses for is it communicates to what degree students are engaging across their classes. So that's a platform where teachers are able to report out, is, I have I not heard from this student? So that's sort of the, the first level that we sort of know what is engagement. Now there's a, there's a number of reasons why a kid may or may not engage. Uh, we are leaning pretty heavily on our uh, uh, school counselors and our guidance counselors uh, who are doing a beautiful and wonderful job reaching out to kids who they're sort of concerned about. Um, so that is that is very, very, very important. Um, and so, you know, I, I I don't exactly have a number right now on the percentage of kids. I can, I can anticipate that it's relatively high in terms of the number of kids who are impacted uh, socially, emotionally during this period. Um, but one of our goal is to sort of do this pretty frequent uh, checking up on kids. Um, so, so we sort of are able to triage and know which kids were, were prioritized. And just to echo a little bit um, from Matt, so similarly at the elementary schools, we are doing the same. Um, and we also meet regularly uh, as a team to talk about those students and to really understand, it really varies school by school. Uh, and there's a, a broad spectrum of student, how how the level of engagement um, that different students and by grade too. Um, so so it's it's really hard to to put a number on that when there's so many different variables, um, particularly between um, you know age level and, and grade. Um, but really, it's that team collaboration where um, the counselors are uh, a, a significant uh, part of the team and they are regularly um, checking with, um, you know, just working with their students, but also working with the other educators to ensure we are reaching all the students and we are identifying what the challenges are for um, each family to increase engagement. Yes, Rebecca and then Helen. Um, so I, I, I think we're doing a really good job, but it's really been a learning curve. So I, I really feel like it's important to say, like, we're now able to, you know, sort of collect the data and try to figure it out. But um, for a long time, I've, you know, I mean, it's been so long now, but the very first week or two, I think we, we had no idea kind of how to navigate this. But 
I think that different systems have been created so that we can identify kids. And I think even just asking them positives and negatives of the week is a, is a good way just to check in and see how they're doing. Um, I really just feel like I need to put in a plug for starting to think about what we need when we go back to school what kids need when we go back because right now we're all sort of like in this weird limbo and you know i mean luckily you know any students that i have whose parents have had COVID 19 the parents have recovered but um i've had other family members i mean there's going to be this is a trauma and i think for every for us too and so i just want us to really be thinking about you know when we go back like as having as much kind of cushion as we can um because it's going to be it's it's going to be just as much of a shock to the system that we weren't coming back that it will be that we are coming back so i just think i i just feel like that needed to be said uh, helen Thank you. Um, that is something that we, we will be thinking about very soon. Uh, you know, I think that's something that that's critical. Um, one question, and thank you for all of your descriptions of what you're doing and and the work that seems to be working. Um, there were two populations that I'm a little concerned about: more vulnerable populations, the populations in the Bright program and in the Winthrop. And I, I know you, the people from there, are not here, so. Maybe at some other time you might tell us about it, or if you happen to know, I'm, I'm not sure which way to go. Uh, I can speak a little bit to the Winthrop House um, department and staff. I meet with them weekly and uh, we had a staff meeting today and they are also tracking their students. Yes, it's a huge concern for us, Susan, our students who have social, emotional, uh, significant vulnerabilities and we are doing multiple um, processes and systems to reach them. Uh, earlier this week, the social worker at Winthrop House held a parent group to try to reach out as much as possible to get everyone as engaged because those are the students typically that are school avoidant. So this now le remote learning environment is not the best landing place for those types of students. Uh, so yes, I agree totally with you. Those are our greatest concern or one of our greatest concerns. And, and Matt might be able to talk a little bit to that too. Um, uh, being, uh, uh, weekly uh, DBT group uh, through Winthrop House and so we've continued that remotely. Um, and so we have some regular attenders uh, to that. And there are a couple of kids um, who I work with individually as well within uh, the program, but um, as Wendy sort of uh, noted, and this is also the case uh, within kids in SFLC and, and a lot of kids in, in general, that you know, for kids who um, haven't always felt good about school or haven't felt good about the academic piece, you know, at this point, it's it, it, it's easier to avoid. Um, and when kids are not feeling great, a coping skill that you know all human beings will use is to avoid. And so, one thing that we're trying really, really hard at is really frequently, and it's tiring, but it's really, really important, is every single day, every single week, making sure that we're engaging kids actively, that we're not just leaving it on kids saying, like, hey, I'm here, let me know if you need anything, because so many of our kids are not going to access us in that way. So really sort of being a little bit more uh, explicit and a little bit more forceful, if you will, is sort of get, reaching out to them through phone calls, engaging with parents, emailing um, really, really consistently. Uh, and one other thing I just want to note with the tracking piece, Susan, with the question that you had asked, uh, through the crisis team, one thing that we're doing um, is that we have um, a running list of, of kids who have had who are immediately impacted by COVID, who so maybe have had family members or themselves um, uh, uh, have had a family member diagnosed with COVID-19 and sort of just tracking that over time. And, and that will sort of give us understanding about kids who may be most impacted during this time. So I, I had a question about, so for student, I wanted to circle back on the special education students. And the, the first, I want to start by saying that I have seen and appreciated our week over week over week progress. 
in both general education and special education. I think that we have done, or not, not we, because it's not, you know, not me, but the, the, the students, the students and the teachers are really learning so much more about the tools that are available and what tools are available. And so you can see from one week to the next, how everyone becomes more comfortable with everything. And so you're able to gain a little bit more that next week, a little bit more, and you can see how much heart and effort the teachers are putting into learning those tools, utilizing those tools into everything that they're putting out there for the students. And so, you know, I just can never, I can never start by saying anything without emphasizing that because it is so clear and it is so incredibly appreciated by parents. Um, the, the part that, I'm, that, I have no, that I have observed is that for students who are on IEPs, and in particular, if they had IEPs where they required help to access the ed, the, that point of education, so that they're needing someone to, you know, as we were talking about, either that they're needing help on the executive functioning, or they're needing help with reading access, or they're needing help with, with students who, even if all this amazing material is out there, especially on this, with we have so much self-directed learning, it's just hard to see how a student not manage self-directed learning can even get to the where they're accessing almost anything. And so, you know, I, I wonder, I heard a little bit today about how, you know, we're receiving um, one or a small group or one or one, so 30 minutes they would be get, they would get half. I, am I understanding that we're trying to move towards where we're providing like half of that small group instruction? Or are we still talking about how we're doing like touch, touch? I'm having trouble understanding, like, knowing what we're providing across the board or this is so individual for everyone that it looks incredibly different for everyone yeah multiple quite layers of questions but those are kind of where where some of my concerns are yeah i think i can answer some of your questions um julie so the half piece i think there might have been some confusion um with regard to the state's guidance on providing um, enough instruction for half the school day, which I did have some parents reach out and say, well, does this mean that I get only half of the services on my kids' IEP? Um, and the answer is no. Um, as you noted, it's hard to have any uh, blanket statement um, or, or I'm sorry, like a, a blanket approach mm -hmm. to um, providing services because it is so individualized and kids present so differently that it's hard to, you know, 50% on one IEP would look very different than another student's IEP at 50%. Um, so that's the hard, I think the hardest piece about this for educators and folks can speak um, on the call who are working with students is to figure out what's that right amount right now and how. Mm -hmm. Um, how frequent is it synchronous or is it asynchronous? I know Desi's guidance is saying asynchronous is better because um, uh, from an equity standpoint, students can access when they can. Um, but for students like you just described who really need that support to even access um, a worksheet, right. then you're looking at more live instruction, more explicit instruction. Um, the good thing is, is that we were, you know, many months into the school year so teachers have a good sense of who those students are mm -hmm. um, and i think like rebecca said is that the learning curve was high in the beginning but now they're really able to hone in on who those kids are um, and as people get used to the platforms and you know schedules they they are able to to um, better shift as they need to so are we so for work you know worksheets and things if you have a student that was receiving small group instruction and they're you know they were in a a speech group for three students, and maybe speech is the wrong example because there might be training that hasn't happened, but let's just pretend they're in a small math group. So they're in a small math group, their small math group met five times a week for 45 minutes with three kids. Are those three kids now able to meet with that learning center math teacher five times a week or any, any times a week to provide actual, the same sort of instruction that they, or support that they were receiving is that being provided to them now? 
So I can tell you that it's being offered. Um, but again, I don't know if the same group at Pierce would be happening at Heath. You know, it depends on the makeup of the group. It depends on student scheduling. What I do know is that special educators are offering opportunities uh, to work on IEP goals. I don't know if it's in the same group as it were when schools were open. But if, but there are, so if they were working in a small group instruction, in some way, we're trying to provide that small group instruction still. So yep. it be different, you know, maybe all the kids are not available now at 10 a.m. So maybe it looks, the makeup of it looks different, but that is still available. Yeah, they are focusing on the IEP uh, goals that they were working on prior to closure or prior to schools being closed. I guess so in that small group of I'm asking the same question that that I'm you're answering the same question that I'm asking is that because there's this part where we go back to the difference of providing worksheets and providing instruction and do, does that mean the same thing to you? No, those are two different yeah, things. Casey, okay. maybe Casey, I'm sorry to interrupt. It maybe helps to maybe hear from Carrie Lynn um, in terms of just how it's happening and specifically at the peer school. Just to, just to give an illustrative example. Yeah, so I'm happy to speak on that. And and honestly, what's what's happening at Pierce is we are providing a lot of services within the classroom. So when, when the teachers are doing their lessons, we'll go out into breakout groups. Um, we have paraprofessionals who are helping us sit at work right now. So for our students who are having difficulties accessing that content within a school day, then we can break out and do that work with them. But we definitely are offering uh, special ed IEP services directly, whether it's through a Google Classroom platform, whether it's through a live video webinar. Um, and it mainly depends, first and foremost, I think, on vulnerability of students and where they're at and significant needs, but also with what the parents can do. I mean, I've had some parents very clearly say, I, it's too much for me to manage. Can my child just meet with the classroom teacher? And then I've had parents who said, can I just have my child meet with the special ed teacher? So I have some special ed teachers, I have to be honest, who are doing more services than they would typically because there's that family need. So I think we're all working individually for the students and for the families right now. And it just depends on individual needs. But I would say a lot of the access to the curriculum and the schoolwork is coming from us popping into classrooms and our paraprofessionals really helping with that work. Um, Pierce sends out their curriculum uh, units. They're trying to get them out as quick as they can so that paras and special ed teachers can accommodate and modify that work when necessary prior to the instruction. So does that answer your question? Well, I guess though, then it raises another question and maybe this is just because across different schools, what instruction is being provided looks very different. So at Pierce, does it, from what you were saying, it sounds like there might be a day of instruction happening. So then the special ed teachers are able to pop into that, that day. At some other schools, there's a 30 minute Zoom touch in and the rest of the week is self-directed learning. And so this might be part, you know, part of my question might be coming from hearing different parents' experiences based on the very different experiences that they're receiving of what a day looks like. Yeah, and I think we've accommodated, I mean, definitely across the board, even within grade levels, things are being done differently. But I would say that if there are more just like um, teachers are doing, classroom teachers are just doing an hour a day, then we are picking up that slack as special ed because we're making sure that during those self-directed times that those kids are able to access and do the work. Okay. All right, um, uh, if there, let's move on to uh, the perspective of a principal so a little broader perspective beyond just special education. Um, and then Robin Asa needs to be let back in. He got booted. Um, so if, while Leslie's giving an update, if you could help out Asa, that'd be a big help. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, good to see everybody. I'm going to try to be brief, and you can shut me down because um, 
I'm really, really proud of the work that is happening at Pierce, and I know very similar work is happening across the district. Um, so I have a lot to say, but I'm going to try to um, temper my comments here. Um, so, you know, I'll start by saying that um, there is no way to um, really exemplify the challenge of moving a school community that really prides itself on the day-to-day -day interactions with students to an absolutely online format. I mean, there are challenges that have arisen over the course of the last month, six weeks, that I just didn't even think. Um, so we're learning as we go. And what's really important to me and the message I've been giving to the Pierce educators is let's stay the course. And I want to see continuous improvement as we go along. And I feel really um, good about the work that's being done. Um, so just to kind of summarize, we're taking a three-tiered approach to this um, online work during the closure. And it's really based on the district guidance that we've been given and on the DESE guidance. So the three prongs we're focusing on are equity and access, distance learning, and maintenance of community. So in terms of the equity and access, this has been a really ongoing thing. And this is about getting technology into the hands of students. Um, one of the VPs, Jim Stoddard, has been really instrumental. He's going to Pierce multiple times a week to get Chromebooks, to distribute them. He's working with Scott Moore. Um, we've given out over 100 Chromebooks. Um, and then sometimes we also need to get hotspots for students that don't have Wi-Fi access. And that's been a real challenge. I've, I, I thought that would be something that was easy to do. Um, but, you know, the family has to have an account with a provider, and then it's working with the family um, to actually get the hotspot solidified. Um, but needless to say, it's gotten done. And there were children that we weren't seeing online the first weeks of school that are now online regularly. Um, so in, uh, in addition to the technology access, also make, making sure families have access to food, um, if there's food insecurity. And so that is ongoing work that's been happening. Um, and then in terms of the distance learning, um, it's, been, it's, it's been a learning process. Um, but what I can say again is there's been continuous improvement. Um, all of the teachers are having synchronous learning experiences, asynchronous, um, and it's getting more and more consistent, right? So an example is um, a grade level team at Pierce that started not doing synchronous learning experiences. Um, and then through having more discussions, they tried it out did one a week, two a week, three a week, um, and it just keeps getting better the more comfortable they get and the more understanding they have around the online platforms. Um, we've really been focusing um, on a, a document that the Office of Teaching and Learning put out um, on uh, April 5th that really outlined a couple of tenets of dis distance learning. That's team collaboration, student weekly learning plans, communicating with students and family, monitoring student engagement, introducing new learning and content, and student daily schedules. And so we've been meeting every week as a faculty. We have almost 100% attendance at those meetings, and our agenda stays the same. We look at those tenants every week. Um, there's always a grade level team that presents to share what's working, what's not working, um, and that's been a real source of professional development for the staff. Um, all of our distance learning experiences can be found on the Pierce website. We tried to make a one-stop shop for families so that they're not sorting through emails, but rather can go to one location to figure out the platform that's being used. Um, and so uh, uh, something that really helped us here was that the middle school had already been very versed in Canvas. So that wasn't a hard um, next step for our kiddos um, or for our families. So the middle school is using Google Classroom and Canvas. Um, the majority of our elementary grades are using, excuse me, using Google Classroom. Um, and then our lower elementary early childhood is using a mix of Seesaw and Google Classroom. Um, so the platforms are, um, are, are pretty consistent. Um, overwhelmingly, one of the things I think that's been really important, I've been incredibly impressed with our teams, is that they're team planning. So that across a grade level, children are focusing on the same skills and objectives. And this is going to be critically important when we go back. 
Um, to per Rebecca's point, um, one of the things that I'm starting to not, not even start, we've been focusing on um, and continue to focus on is what needs to happen at Pierce when we go back to school. In what ways does the schedule need to look different? Um, what approach are we going to need to take that's different in those opening days of school? What professional development do the teachers need? Um, so in many ways, we're doing this in tandem while we're focusing on these three prongs. Um, we're also starting to focus on next year. And Jamie Yadoff, who does a great job um, of building the schedule, is thinking about what intervention blocks need to look like. How do we need to possibly use paras differently so they can provide instruction um, to the kiddos where the gaps might be bigger um, or larger than um, for, for other students. Um, let's see. Um, I think in terms of the maintenance of community, um, there's a lot that's being done, and I think families have found this really helpful just in terms of how we continue to keep children engaged and seeing one another. Um, so this week um, there was a crafting club. So the art teacher um, was in a synchronous learning experience with the ECS teacher, um, as well as a paraprofessional. And it was really lovely to see some kids knitting, um, some kids doing art, and they were they were chilling <laughs> with one another. And I think that that is also as important as the academic piece. There were about 16 students there um, and three um, uh, adults with them. And so um, it was nice to see them continuing to maintain community in that way. Um, our assistant principal, Jim Stoddard, does the morning announcements um, during the regular school day. And so now he's transitioned that to online. And I've heard really positive feedback from parents about that. And then John Badger, who's another assistant principal or vice principal, um, who manages grades six to eight is actually doing virtual lunches. So he's having, you know, online lunch with kids once a week. And we have a, a, a really big number of kids um, who are logging on for that. Um, so, you know, it's in terms of the distance learning, going back to that, it's, it's a work in progress, but what I see I'm incredibly proud of, um, I always use the metric of, is this something that I would want my daughter to participate in? And overwhelmingly, I feel really comfortable saying that it is. Um, a couple more points I wanted to make. Sorry, so many things I wanna say. Um, I think, you know, just one thing to focus on is, again, the continuous improvement. Um, so again, where we started with fewer synchronous learning opportunities, um, we're building those. And then as we start adding the layer of more specialists doing virtual um, learning opportunities, paraprofessionals getting involved, um, talking about the special education providers that are now getting involved, um, it's really making for a much more robust setup. And so, um, again, I, I would welcome, you know, I, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but um, I'd welcome any questions, but also any offline discussions um, to talk more specifically what's happening at Pierce. Um, and while I am talking about Pierce, I know that just from talking with my colleagues, a lot of this work is happening across the K-8s as well. Mm -hmm. So I can, if you have specific, this is Asa, I was locked out, but now I'm back. Um, if you had specific questions for Leslie, which I'm sure you do, um, please ask. But I feel like the having kind of the Heath experience might help you formulate ideas and stuff. I mean, everything that Leslie said and that Casey and that great team, K-8, K-12, actually, we're talking about with special education. I mean, all of that holds true at Heath. I think one of the questions somebody asked um, earlier was, how are we keeping track of kids? And, you know, I've got spreadsheets on top of spreadsheets linked to spreadsheets, right? That loop back into spreadsheets. There's so much like work happening. Um, but a lot of times it's just really good old fashioned legwork. We're just reaching out to families. I'm reaching out to my team. It's just really working hard to make a human connection in these times. Clearly I'm in my basement, right? I've never worked from my basement before. And so I keep telling people like, um, in so many ways, I've been a school principal for, I think, 15 years or something now. And so most 99% of the time I can say, this isn't my first rodeo, right? But now it's like, this is my first rodeo. I've never done this before. Um, it's all of our first rodeo um, and really big patience, but we don't have to ask so much forgiveness, I'm finding, because the work is really 
um, like Leslie was talking about, taking off in ways that are um, pretty unbelievable to to watch. I've joined staff meetings um, with you know teams of people. My my CST team meets, my PSS team meets, my SST team meets. So we're focusing on really kind of high needs kids. It's with ed plans, all my uh, teaching teams meet and I join a lot of those. And what I've seen is this kind of relaxing from, from extreme anxiety with staff to a relaxing into this new practice. Um, and I really remind people not to get so relaxed that they, you know, forget kind of where we need to go next because that transition back is going to be extremely intense no matter what it looks like, and it could look like a few things. Um, so that's gonna be intense. So don't get so comfortable that you forget to keep, you know, two steps ahead in your practice as well, but also don't get so kind of um, relaxed or don't stay so anxious that you don't learn these new practices and, you know, really start to adopt them into your everyday practices. Because I think, you know, it's 2020 um, and we are flipping our classes in really creative ways more and more and more. So the more we can actually be present and learn, but also stay hyper focused on what's coming next, I think is a really positive tension that I'm hoping to instill in my staff. And I see them doing more and more and more. Um, and also, I, I feel like times like these, like you really get to see the strengths kind of emerge from the people. Um, my paras are doing amazing connected work in the school, um, very involved in the life of the school and the life of the kids. Um, I'm seeing our interns, right, who could have disappeared and gone home. They're staying present in our school. They're teaching lessons. They're earning those hours. They're staying very involved um, with the kids and in projects. Um, and so those are the kinds of things I think I can add that perspective. Um, but what you're seeing and hearing about in all the other schools is really what's happening at Heath as well. We had a poem in a pocket day today. That was National Poetry Month. So we're still celebrating those things. It's Ramadan. We're still celebrating those things as a community. Our student council is really active still. Our Gay Straight Trans Alliance is super active in the school. Um, and so, you know, we're still finding ways to be who we are but also really present in the moment so that we're not pretending that something else isn't really, you know, the mechanism behind all of this. Um, and we've had a really good response from our parents. It's been intimate, passionate, honest, very loving, um, careful work with our families. And um, I feel like we're getting kind of dividends on these relationships we've built over the years. So um, it's a very difficult time. Um, excruciating in many, many ways. Of course, families are sick. I heard today about a family where everybody in the house is has COVID, fully diagnosed, and some are heading to the hospital, some are just hunkered down. You have mental health issues cropping up. Um, I have staff with, you know, newborn babies that are actively engaged in the class placement process. Um, and so, you know, this is, these are the times of our lives. And I think it's the community and the, the relationships that we've built over the years that are really sustaining us right now and allowing us to stay focused on doing our best when everything else seems to be kind of falling apart. And if I could say one more thing, I mean, I think one of the greatest challenges I'm seeing is just how this pandemic is so fluid and always changing. Our work is always changing. And so we're always just trying to keep on top of what's next. And what's what's difficult is that it it's so many approaches and, and so many unique needs that we need to address. So for the amount of um, families that I get that say, I would like to have more of this. I have just as many families saying, I can't do this much work. I, I need, I need some help. My, you yeah. know, my kids on the screen, I, you know, I can't, there, there's a plethora of issues that we're really, um, trying to manage. Yeah. And so, you know, this is a time too, and I'm so thankful to be in a district that has resources like a steps advisor, mm -hmm. a MECO advisor. They're doing um, small group work. They're having lunch groups. They're following up with families for me. They're getting kids online. I mean, it's really, it, it's a whole group effort. And, um, you know, 
the community has really risen to the occasion. I've cried at like three faculty meetings just because I'm so proud. I'm so, you know, proud that people are really, you know, standing up and, and doing the work that needs to be done amidst having, you know, family members that have passed away. Um, or, you know, being at home and, and we have a teacher with several teachers, but one for sure I think about whose um, husband is in uh, is a healthcare provider and she's home with multiple children um, and she's still managing all these things. And so a big part of what I've been doing is when I have get feedback from a family where they're wanting more, I reach out to that family via phone and we have a conversation about just the complexities of the work. And I also want to have a better understanding of what they need as a family. Um, and those um, conversations have been really helpful to me, and, and I believe they've been helpful um, to, to parents in terms of managing expectations and letting them know, you know, we're not sitting home hanging, um, you know, there are many times that something can get in the way that is related to the pandemic and is really a family crisis. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that being said, I, I really hope that as a, a school committee, as a governing body, that you do know there's really good work happening out there and, and you can be really proud of the work that's happening. Agreed. Agreed. Yes, Suzanne? Yes, yeah, so I just thank you so much. It's, it's A little awesome. louder, Suzanne. Okay. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I just I just wondered for the, a family or a parent who just feels the child is not getting what they need or they just Talk to someone about what's going on with this remote learning. Uh, do we, who do we suggest they call? I mean, is it the principal? Is it DPF? Is it special ed teacher? I just, what, what advice would you give? So, so I'm going to just jump in. And my first question that I ask is, what do you think they need? Mm -hmm. What's missing? W what more? Tell me, just tell, I, I lead with curiosity. But oftentimes I do take the call. So, you know, I don't need everybody to call me. I really do think that the first point of contact still should be with the teacher, you know, because our systems haven't changed so radically that, you know, that voice isn't really the first and most intimate they should hear from in most cases. But I think it's about managing the relation, the worry mm. at this time. So many people are worried and they don't have any more touch points. I also hear a lot, not a lot, I've heard like two times families who are like, oh my God, I, I think my child has a learning disability. They surely need to be reading better than this. What's the evaluation process? And I really say, tell me more, but link back to that teacher who's like, no, all of our data shows this. You're seeing your kid in a completely different context. So I think the, that they can contact who they want to contact, right? There's no... There's no gatekeeping really, but at the same time, I want to know more and I want my teachers to find out more too. What's the worry? What's the anxiety? What's missing? What do you, what's your perception? And then go from there because it just might be a generalized anxiety. My kid's not in school, therefore I'm failing them and in 10 years, it's really going to hit them hard when they're trying to, you know, get into the college of their choice. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different kinds of anxieties uh, uh, that are, have really been awakened in the world. And that's what I want to know more about first, I think. And, and Suzanne, I, I, the only thing I'll add to, to what uh, Asa said was, uh, I'll reiterate one, one thing he said, which is the first point in contact, as it always is, is the classroom teacher or, or the teacher that, you know, your concern, parents concerned about the child, you know, if it's, a, if it's a learning specialist, if it's a special, special educator, if it's, you know, a guidance counselor. But, but start there and then, and then the principal or vice principal or guidance counselor but really, it, it's, which is the same as we have in, if school is open. So begin there, please. Um, I'll remind parents of that in my next communication. Principals remind remind them of that as well. But but it's, it's you know, and then if necessary, talk to other folks, guidance counselor, principal, that sort of thing. But, but I really do appreciate what Asa said about asking, uh, curi being, coming from a place of curiosity to find out more. Um, that is always so helpful when we take that stance. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if many or all teachers are doing this, but I just wanted to mention one of my daughter's teachers had has scheduled a weekly. She has like a drop in hour where the kids can in, uh, office hour yep. also added a drop in office hour for parents. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't know to 
it, it has, I, I'm not sure how many people have participated in it, um, but just I thought that, that was a wonderful resource. It, it was something I happened, my daughter had wanted me to go with her and ask a question. And so we dropped in during mm -hmm. the, the office hour and it was, you know, tremendous. And so I, I know many teachers are doing many wonderful things. I just wanted to mention that that was something that, that I have seen that is happening. Yeah. And, you know, just the other day, our seventh grade team had an open house. Um, and I thought, oh, everybody's kind of like Zoomed virtual meeting out. I thought there would be you know, a handful of people. We had 50 parents. Um, and so they were able to ask the questions they have about, you know, you know, what is my child missing? How are you going to address this going forward? And so I think when people have the opportunity to ask those questions in real time, that also can lessen the, the anxiety because they want to know that we're thinking about this and that, you know, this isn't just a learning gap that we're going to be okay with, but that we're, you know, planning next steps and we're going to, we're, we're going to address the needs of students. Thank you. Thank you so much to, bo to both of you for I do have another question if I may. Sorry. Oh, yes, David. Uh, could one or both of you speak to current participation rates, particularly at the middle school level, and about what percentage of students are completing their work? Mm -hmm. So we are um, actively, our, our teachers at the middle school level um, are really, have, were great right out of the gate on that. Um, and so they were very quickly, after just a few weeks, um, able to say, this is who I'm seeing, and this is the rate of return on work and these percentages. There was after the first couple of, and I don't have exact figures on me, so I'm not going to pretend I do, but there was a period at first where there was some pretty high engagement um, across the board, six through eight, because I think people were, kids were excited, and parents were excited, and this felt new and fresh, and then there was a dip, and I think that was a dip in uh, an emotional dip, I know I felt one where I was like, man, this is exhausting. I don't, I can't keep up. There's so much stuff. And the better teachers got, the more kind of work started to pile on, I feel like, from a teenager's perspective. And I have one in my house. Um, she slammed the door and called me dumb today because I asked if she had finished social studies. So, okay, I get it. Um, and so then it kind of, we had another peak. So right now we're in a peak where we're getting probably 75% attendance you know, most of the time from most kids um, and really looking at what's completed, what did they try and didn't complete, and then what did they not attempt and kind of figuring out why. But that allows us more of that space that we were talking about previously in so many iterations here around finding out who are the kids who are not present, right? So we're not looking at 25% participation. We've got 75% of the class that we need to worry about quite the opposite. We have so many touches on the ball with most of the kids most of the time that it really frees up our, our staff to focus on the small percentage that's just not showing up at all or haphazardly. And would you we say have, these percentages are fairly across the board for all our schools or are some schools at significantly higher rates than others? I don't know. Um, yeah. And while, while the principals have um, it, so just another piece of, of, of the coordination collaboration that you heard about tonight is um, principals and cheerleaders have been meeting, been meeting three times a week. Um, mm -hmm. As you also heard, guidance counselors across the district meet, meet multiple times. You know, grade level teachers at middle school meet. You know, there's a lot of meeting and coordination here. And in our principal meetings, our principals have shared um, similar reports in terms of tracking completion. Um, we haven't aggregated that up or compared them um, uh, school to school yet, but um, folks are tracking that. We just haven't uh, haven't thought yet to, um, you know, create a comparison. Um, but something we can work on. And our and our K five participation is super high. So, super high. Um. I'm hesitant to ask more questions um, because our folks have been here for a long time. Um, and we do have to move on to an update just about uh, uh, finances and the budget. Um, I, I, you know, are these updates uh, just like a long time ago when you were giving your budget updates are all designed to help inform the committee and then the, the broader general public um, about 
what's happening. It is, it is so hard as a school committee member, as a superintendent even, to get a real insight into our schools in, uh, in, in normal circumstances um, and across our schools especially. Um, and these days and ages, it's even more difficult uh, to do that. So I really um, appreciate um, our folks coming and joining us tonight and helping uh, tell the stories of the great work that's happening um, by so many people. Um, and I certainly, even more than they're coming tonight, I appreciate the leadership they're providing, um, capital L, small small L, but in so many ways. Uh, and the way that I think, I think I'll just talk about what Leslie said in terms of the ongoing improvement that our you know, teachers are doing with each other, that our school leaders are, are helping and nudging along in so many different ways and so many different approaches. Uh, it is, um, it is uh, remarkable. Uh, I really appreciate the messages tonight about uh, give us, you know, grace and gratitude. Uh, there isn't enough of that, even as much as there is, there couldn't be enough of that in a time that's so difficult as this. Um, so I, I appreciate that message as well. Um, and just really thank folks for, for everything you're doing and for being here tonight. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you also to Maria. And I saw that there are some others. Wendy, thank you. And thank you to everyone who participated, but you know, who's who has left the call. We we appreciate all the hard work that's happening. Thank you all too very much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, then next we have an update. Is that Nicole? Are you providing the update on the remote learning working group and task force? Yes, she will. Well, she's getting ready. I just want to add in, in the um, drive folder, mm -hmm. there are two things um, that we shared with you earlier this week. But one is Dr. Gittin's letter to all to the K-8 staff, introducing the um, common learning expectations for K-8 for the remainder of the year. Um, and also in that drive folder are the common expectations themselves and the links to um, you know, it's actually the introduction of that, but then the links to all of them, which you can uh, see as well. Um, and I just want to thank uh, Nicole for her leadership on this. Her, also Mary Brown, um, collaborated, coordinated, cajoled, and sort of herded our very excellent coordinators on getting this done, work done very quickly and then working with principals so then they could understand it and support it. So um, I'll just leave that as an introduction. Um, so thank you, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Um, so this earlier this week, um, we were able to put out the learning common learning expectations for the rest of the year for grades K to eight in each content area. Um, and we got a lot of positive feedback about the organization of the material, um, the uh, inclusion of uh, really thinking through um, the importance of our specialists, our, um, you know, librarians, um, and other support folks and being able to, um, support classroom teachers in providing more instruction. Um, we also had the coordinators did have office hours and have more office hours tomorrow for folks to come in and ask questions and provide feedback. Um, we were actually, um, the uh, Gabe, who is the um, coordinator of the social studies, did make some adjustments to um, what is typical of uh, the kindergarten year where they talk about money and work. Um, and so one of the, some of the feedback that he got uh, from a kindergarten teacher, just not even thinking about, you know, like, this is the time of the year. This is normally what we do. This is what, you know, we put in the common learning expectations, but really thinking about how many people in the community have potentially been impacted by uh, COVID and, um, and perhaps lost jobs or at least lost wages. And so we wanted, he was able to make that adjustment, remove that from the kindergarten, um, expectations and select something else for um, us to work on. And so that was really an important part of being able to have office hours for teachers to give feedback once they're looking at them. I'm looking at the document now 
um, live and there are tons of people on here now actually live their their um, icon isn't even faded like they're just sitting somewhere with the document open but they're actively um, looking at the document right now um, so that that had been you know the work that the team engaged in um, and making sure that we are spending money um, to support the learning, the common learning expectations, making sure that teachers have the materials that they need, um, any videos that they need, how can we substitute out like actual insects with, you know, time delayed videos of insects that would be supportive of the instructional practice. Um, we've um, entered into a contract with Seesaw, which is an online platform that is typical for K um, to grades K to two. Um, and we also have updated the staff support website. Um, it is, we had, we have a lot of resources. It wasn't necessarily as user friendly as it needed to be. And so that's been updated and um, teachers are able to find the common learning expectations there. They're able to um, find, see the um, different online platforms that we recommend because we have um, privacy agreements signed with those companies. Um, they're able to learn more about how to use technology um, and, and have modules and training and access to that. The next phase of what we're working on is actual um, professional development um, so that it's be moving beyond the technical aspect of teaching in a remote learning environment um, and in, instead is looking at the instructional practices that benefit students in the remote learning environment so that we're just building uh, capability in that area. Um, BEF has actually funded us um, $7,000 to use um, at our discretion to provide professional development and how we got to this place is, um, you know, there's a process that we go through with BEF. They've been willing to support us from the beginning. And normally what we do is we say, this is what we want to do. They have a conversation. They say, yes, they give us the funds, but because things are turning around so quickly, we actually missed out on the, the first round of professional development that we wanted to engage in. And so they given us, um, up to $7,000 to spend on professional development. Right now, what we are doing is trying to make sure that our um, ETFs, ETSs, excuse me, our ed tech specialists, our um, coordinators, and other support folks in the district are trained so that they can then run trainings multiple times in the district and so that it's not just stuck in a school with a teacher who learned something but um will be able to those folks will be able to build capacity in the district and provide multiple trainings um to support teachers in the learning process they'll be able to work one-on-one -on -one with folks to support them as well as run some modules um i think you know at this point point, um, while nothing is perfect, as you heard from the folks who spoke earlier and from our principals, the people are getting better and better at this remote learning ex um, environment, um, and that we have a solid foundation for teachers to continue to build upon and to continue to um, um, engage in um, practices that are effective for students. Um, we teachers are continuing to work in a team approach. They are continuing to um, collaborate, work with coordinators, work with um, our literacy and math specialists and coaches um, in order to create um, relevant content and to support um, teachers in really how it is that things can be more easily accessible to families and to students. Um, in the remote learning environment. I think um, now, and, and this, was, um, this was alluded to earlier, um, it's really important for us to 
um, allow teachers to continue to grow with the support of the principals and the coordinators, but we also need to start thinking about what is going to happen for next year. Um, what is going to happen um, if, if we are in um, the same mode of delivering um, education at the beginning of next year? Are we back in school? Are we having a staggered start? And so we really need to think about those things and start planning for those things now. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Um, you know, as, as folks said earlier, like I am just super appreciative of how nimble um, people have been in this process and it might not feel like that to everyone in the community, but the work and the ability for people to change on a dime um, adapt and change and invent practices that did not exist in this district previously um, has really just been impressive on a level. People are, are supporting each other and are really trying to figure out how to, how to get um, the work to be um, student facing and organized and um, recognizing that people are trying to learn different things and um, really trying to support people without um, without uh, making people feel, you know, uh, support people and make them feel comfortable in, in venturing into this um, world of remote learning. Um, and I think our teachers, our coordinators, our principals are all doing um, amazing work our directors um, and program coordinators um, are just, you know, in, are impressing me every day. Um, and so that's pretty much it for me. I know there's a ad hoc um, task force meeting tomorrow that was organized by, I'm assuming, Susan and Sharon. And so maybe um, Susan can speak about that. Uh, sure. No, it's just a, I mean, it, I think the, what's uh, the agenda out there is to um, hear about the update on, you know, Desi put out new guidance last Friday. So people really want to hear what the district thinks about that. Um, it was a pretty extensive document and they want us to tell them what we think about it. Um, so that was one of the things um, they want to hear about the learning expectations process for K-8 and um, what, you know, just what they are, what are, What's the rollout plan? What role are parents going to play? How it's going to work? Um, I think there was sort of an overall issue. Of, there was an overall agenda item of just district-wide issues that we might want to pick up on um, based on tonight. And so we should just talk about that here um, as to what we might want to hear. And then um, some, I know that people have been talking about a survey. Um, and I know there are various other districts that have surveys. Um, I know Sharon has thoughts on surveys. She's done a lot of surveys in her career. Um, and so you, we just sort of have to figure out, um, I, I, it would be helpful if you guys had a, a thought as to what you wanted to do with that. Um, but if you don't, I mean, I can ask Sharon to share her thoughts. Um, I, I think these things are always better led by educators, but, um, but I understand that everyone's really busy. So um, we can ask her her thoughts. Are you wanting input, Susan, are you wanting input from school committee members about whether a survey is helpful or from what's, what's, use, what's useful as you have? What's well, I don't know. I mean, it's yeah. been mentioned a number of times, so I'm not entirely sure they mentioned. Erin was working on one. Like, it's just been in, there's been a lot of conversation about it. And again, I just, it would so be a gotta, sense of what. There are a lot of things that we could potentially ask that feel like they need feedback. Um, mm -hmm. We had a um, meeting earlier this, I think it was earlier this week. Or was it last week? I, I, earlier this week, Casey, yes? Yeah, it was um, on Monday. Okay. <laughs> um, with Panorama about um, some of the work that they've done and they've, they've given us some recommended questions for work that they're doing in New York City, Boston Public Schools, and some of the other districts in the area. Um, and so they've given us some suggestions. We're looking at um, what some of those questions would be, but I, I'm supposing that tomorrow would be a good place to get 
some questions that folks want to hear answered. Um, there are some things that, um, you know, I, there are some, you know, when we had our last meeting, there were some things that people asked for that just aren't in the purview of the school system, but um, it's good to know what some of the challenges are that families face. Um, so. Yeah, so to the extent that you're needing, is to the extent that it is helpful an input of whether a survey is useful, I just want to say personally, I think that it would be incredibly useful. I think one of the things that's happening, and we in school committee always struggle with, no matter what the issue, is that as we hear things, you have no idea if that is what is being experienced by five people, by 50 people, or by most people in the district. And that goes for positive things, for negative things. It goes for general experience and what's happening. And so, especially in this very unique circumstances where people might be kind of siloed at their home or not connected in the same ways that they usually are and ha not having as many outlets to, to share and feel connected and to feel like they're being heard. I think that a survey is very important for many, many reasons. And I would love to see some questions that help to get at some of those things of, you know, what are we doing well? What can we be doing better? How, how can we help in ways, um, you know, I just, I just think that that would be incredibly useful at this point, especially as we're half, you know, as we're halfway into this um, stay at home period, you know, I think we're seven weeks, seven weeks in, seven weeks to go, or seven weeks in, eight weeks to go. And so, now that we've kind of ramped up, we have more things happening. Uh, I think it would be a really useful, useful time to get feedback. Yes, Helen. One of the things I, I would suggest we try and ask is what is the dosage that kids are getting? Mm -hmm. now, how many, you know, in, in real terms, how many in, in person um, times are they doing? How many asynchronous times? How many and how many times per week? What, you know, just how, how long? Just a simple piece, I think, would help us to get a sense of what it's like throughout the district. And does Panorama, so we have a contract with them, correct? We do. Yes, yes we do. And um, yes, we do. And we, so we've talked to them. We've also seen, um, so we will be doing this. This is not a question of if, more of when, and what the questions will be. Um, we've also seen Wellesley survey and Arlington survey, so a little closer to home. Um, and so, you know, we have those as models as well. You know, gotten some input from them about how they wish they'd asked the questions. Uh, so, uh, but it will help us get a uh, uh, sort of broad sense um, of how things are going for people and um, and what their what the what families' experiences are at this point. There's a wide range, and I think we continue to hear that wide range. I think the other piece is the urgency that people are feeling. And if there's a way of getting that out, let's say by Monday, I mean, you want to do a good survey because putting out a survey and not getting good answers that really help us aren't, isn't going to be helpful. However, that being said, I think, you know, that using the task force to look over the questions, maybe giving some input, you know, using, um, you know, putting out 10 of them to some parents just for comments so that you can get, see what's working and what's not, and then getting it out by Monday or so. I think the sooner it happens, the better off we will be. Nicole, if there's one from another district that you like, you know, or feels like it would be, you know, ask some of the questions that you think would be useful to gather back information perhaps you can you you know you provide that to the task force tomorrow and get feedback um, in real time about different or, or whether that's good as it is or if there are different questions and maybe that would be a good use of tomorrow to help move the ball along then you got that you, you have, got, <laughs> have the surveys that you're talking about I, I'm pretty sure she directs that question to you. 
Well, I, yes. I, I, I do. I met with people. Do, 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 I got it. I got it. <laughs> that they've asked broadly, like it's it's too big to even bring into a meeting. So, the my office along with Casey's office is working on like muddling through some questions. I don't. That's probably not going to be a good use of time. But if you have the ones from Arlington and where'd you say? And Wellesley, yeah, I think. And Wellesley, just, I think just to use those as a, as a straw man to get some input might be helpful. I think yeah. that's the best thing to do. Yeah, because I I do think it's important to have good questions, but that yes. this is probably one of those places that perfect is the enemy of of done and useful, and so you know nothing guaranteed. We're not trying for perfection at all. We we've, we've given up on even thinking about it. It. There's nothing perfect that's happening in this environment. <laughs> so that's not that's not the goal. What we want to do is ask questions that will help us build um, and make sure it's something that's in our purview, you know, like something we could actually be actionable on. Okay, so that's that. And then Susan, you had asked, you had a multi, or, or Helen, someone, whoever had asked their question had a multi-part question. Did, have we answered all the parts? Oh, one other, sorry, one other reminder is translations take time too. And we, we do need to make sure that we get feedback from everybody and not just a few people in the community. We mm -hmm. want to make sure that we translate the document. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if it start, you know, we get it out and then there's a lag of, you know, giving, having it translated and then getting it out as well, because um, it's probably also going to take us a little bit of time to compile all of that um, information. So even if it trickles back in different waves, I think it is, that is helpful and important to make sure we get those different community groups. And then for the feedback that you're receiving from, T so on the learning expectations that were put out, we're, I'm glad to hear that there have been opportunities for feedback. Um, especially because the BEU uh, wasn't able to participate in the, in the process of developing those. I think it's great to have that vehicle to provide input. Are you getting, are you hearing from teachers that this is something that this is, you, you know, useful to have, you know, so, useful, like. So, right, before this even, before this went out, um, that's this is something that teachers were asking for. Like, what should we focus on? Um, because I think they want to be organized in their approach. Um, and while there wasn't a massive involvement of teachers, the coordinators are working with groups of teachers anyway. Um, and so they they have vetted things through the groups of teachers with whom they've worked. Um, you know, during this during the closure. Um, so it wasn't maybe as systematic as you we would normally do something like this, um, but teachers definitely had some input prior to things going out, um, and teachers, educators were asking for this kind of um, support and narrowing of information. Yeah, let me just clarify one thing, which I think you may have um, not be clear on is is they're finalized and they're operational. And then this week, we, this week staff are planning, you know, they're, and they're, they're using it in their planning for next week. Okay. okay. So, because all that input and, and whatnot had happened the week, the weeks, pri the week prior. Sorry. Yeah. 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 So That's they're, they're live and operational. Okay. We'll share them with the task force tomorrow, but, um, yeah, they're and they're and just to answer a question around, uh, the, you know, commissioner Riley's, uh, update, which, you know, which one of the main pieces was putting out um you know that uh, from desi essential standards for people to focus on so you know we were very much in alignment in doing what he's now put out and doing it you know before uh we're not concerned about whether or not those jive exactly with ours our standards we our expectations we put out are aligned to the same frameworks they are more focused on what we're doing because the coordinators and our teachers, you know, it's based on our scope and sequence and when we do certain units. So um, it's not, it's it's most important that they're aligned to what we're doing and also to the state frameworks. It's not necessarily as important that they're aligned to just what Jesse put out as the, you know, essential standards, you know, for the rest of the year. Um, Jesse's really putting those out um, 
it's more the 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 uh, principle and practice of doing it. Yes, he's putting it, that out for uh, many districts who don't have the capacity that we have to you know identify our own. Um, but as long as ours are are also aligned with the state frameworks, that's what's that's what's important here. Yeah. Um, and none of the none of the items are new. Um, they are typically what folks would do around this time of the year anyway. Um, and so any teachers who've um, taught this material before, this might be a, a challenge for some of our new teachers, but for folks who've taught the material before, who've gone through a full school year, would be familiar with the, um, the learning expectations or should be. So it is new learning, but it's not new. It's right. Not a, right, a this new is what would have happened around this time in fourth grade, fifth grade, third grade, anyway. And then as part of the conversation um, that's happening at the working group tomorrow, tomorrow, has it already happened or is it happening of a conversation about, you know, what a day looks like, you know, some, some input on what a day looks like, on things like whether instruction is being provided live, those sorts of questions, or what's, what is the, what are the thoughts around that? Susan? I don't know what the, I, I don't think I've, I don't have the agenda. So is that what's on the agenda, Susan? Susan, you're on mute. I have no idea about the answer to your question because I think there were conversations about whether or not those things had to happen and I just don't know where those stand. Um, so I'll provide an update. Um, so we were working, I think, uh, Julie, you and I talked about this during docket preview, but we were working, um, have been working with the principals and the coordinators on whether or not it's necessary to put out very specific uh, directives uh, related to how much teachers should be doing X, Y, or Z, synchronous, asynchronous, or other things each day and uh, or each week. And um, working closely with the principals uh, the principals believed, and, and and I agree with this, and I think so is Dr. Gittins, that the progress we're making, as you heard about tonight, um, the leadership that the principals are providing, uh, the coordination and support from coordinators and so many other folks is, is helping us head in very much the right direction. And they believe, and I believe, um, that to put out uh, very specific directives at this point uh, what teachers should be doing each day and each week would be uh, disruptive and destructive to the progress everyone's making. Um, so I look, listen very closely to the principals. They are the ones in this district who have, you know, the, the closest pulse on their school communities and their staff. And I take, um, and I think, and Nicole, I speak for Nicole here too, I believe, um, you know, takes their uh, guidance and their uh, input very, we, we have a lot of faith in that, and um, and so that's and that and that was you know, working through uh, a number of the meetings we've had over the past two weeks, and really pushing hard each other, you know, each direction basically. So uh, that's where we are at this point, and uh, they are confident. I'm confident in them that they can can continue to uh, lead and support and help their staff uh, make the, the uh, appropriate amount of progress um, for all learners. So in the- I think, update, um, I think in, what you in, heard in, Leslie, Leslie say earlier oh, about, sorry. Just, just one last thing. We are oh. um, providing further clarification of, uh, of the types of learning that folks are already doing and defining a little bit further in the next uh, our next uh, update on uh, on guidance, uh, but we won't be giving di clear directives about how much each teacher should teach in which mode on which days. Um, I think what you heard Leslie say earlier is that you know there's an expectation that people will continue to improve, and that you know as she's worked with and guided folks who weren't doing any um, synchronous learning, they they're building their capacity. And um, I think that's, that is happening in more places than just um, at Pierce. 
but Leslie is pretty much spoke the same way that all of the principals did, which is this is the work that we're doing and we're helping to build capacity um, in a way that we always do. So the part, the part that I'm like not quite sure about is, is are we are we moving to a place where we this is the goal, like this is the gold standard and we're we're with 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 time and the leadership and the guidance of the principals, we believe everyone can get to that gold standard. Or is what we are saying at a fundamental level is that what teachers are doing at different schools and different grades and different classrooms is different and that's okay. Like I'm, I'm trying because those are two very different things. Uh, well, I'm not sure if the, we are saying that our teachers with the support of our school leaders and the office of teaching and learning and the office of student support, student services. Okay. And the, and the support of coordinators and and myriad other folks, as you heard tonight, are continuing to improve and continue to get stronger and better at this and continue to provide more and more services. Um, and there's going to be variation and, uh, and flexibility. And um, and for ready, for, for then there always is in Brookline. Um, uh, we have heard for years now how important autonomy is. And especially in this, in this day and age, there needs to be um, flexibility on all sides. I mean, you heard this a number of times tonight um, because there are uh, families who want very different things and can handle very different things. There are staff who are in very different positions. So uh, we are doing, we are, it is very strong what we're providing across the board and um, where there are areas of that need to be improved, the principals are very much aware of those and they continue to support those staff um, and uh, as they always do. And so I guess the both and we are continuing to improve and strengthen our work like every district is, and there is going to be variance. Yeah, I guess, I mean, it, the, the place that I struggle with is this, what I still am really grappling with is that for, for saying everyone's not going to be gold. And so we're okay with some gold, silver, and bronze. Or if we're saying there are many different ways to be at gold, so therefore we're not going to define what that means. Or if what we're saying, it's just going to take time, but we all know, but, but we know what gold is and it's going to take time and we're getting everyone to gold. And those are different things. Um, and so. So I think, um, how to say this? This is um, the imperfect science of teaching. Um, and we, we all um, have an expectation for teachers to reach a certain level that really is all about student engagement and supporting the students they have in front of them. Um, and so that's different in every, in every space. I think what's challenging to recognize for many folks is that this is how school is anyway. People always do things differently. Teachers always approach their students differently, their work differently. That hasn't changed in this environment. It's been more of a struggle for people. Um, it's been more of a challenge. It's been new learning, but it hasn't changed that that educators approach the way they do their work differently. I think, and again, in, in a regular school environment, principals are doing the same thing they're doing right now, which is working with the people who need the support and helping them to get better at that. And not saying this is exactly what you need to do, but you need to meet the needs of your students. Students need to be able to ask questions of you. Students need to be able to make connections with their um, classmates and teachers need to figure out how to make sure that that happens in the way that they know how to. Um, and we provide very clear definitions around what that is and how that can go and, and, and um, best practices or, or um, more effective practices. 
Um, but there's no mandate as if as there is never a mandate about exactly how teachers engage with students. Well, but there's there's variation to the extent of we say, you know, and I don't know what these are, so I'm just making this, I appreciate that I'm making this up, but, you know, we would say in fourth grade in social studies, you will learn geography. And so one teacher might decide to do Japanese, you know, the geography of Southeast Asia, and one might decide to do geography of Europe. And there's variation in that, there's variation in how they teach it. But the kids, you know, there are parameters for in the way that, that teachers are teaching, and there are parameters in the way that the day is structured. And there, there are just, there are certain, it's not completely, um, you know, it's just, it's not completely un, unscaffolded. And so I'm just, I'm wondering where, if we're at that right balance of defining what it is that an ideal day for a student in the moment of COVID and doing remote learning, what are we as a district saying in an ideal way, this is how to operate in these circumstances? You know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if other, other school committee members have different thoughts on this or if, you know, if I'm the only one who, who wonders if there's not more, it, you know, it's kind of like the portrait, the, this portrait of the graduate conversation we've had, you know, like, as we're thinking of like, this is the, this is the place we're trying to move through. How are ways we can get there? Is that not the same conversation? This is the place that we want to get through in this. What are the ways, the right ways that we get there? And what does that look like? You know, I, I just I'm I'm still hearing of very different experiences throughout the district, tremendously different experiences. And so, you know, I just wonder if there's not more kind of consistency that can help with with some of that difference of experience. And I think what you just said is happening. Like we want to make sure students so we want to make sure students learn these things at these grade levels this is what you should focus on for the rest of the year how you teach it is up to you we and and that's always been that except now that we're actually saying these are the things that teachers should teach because they've asked for that guidance and we want to really make sure that there's a um a solid foundation or or a similar foundation for a common foundation for us to build on for next year. Um, and so I think what you're talking about is happening. I just, I think we are having two different discussions about how that, how that happens. And so I, you know, again, hearing from the folks that spoke earlier today, hearing from principals, that's what's happening minus some I don't know, heavy fist of, so I don't know. But maybe there's a different way for me to ask this and not and to stop talking about like geography and stuff. If, if we, if we, let's look at gym. And if we say there are many different ways you can teach gym to a fourth grader, but in a school, in a regular school day setting, we would say kids are going to gym class. And in gym class, you will do something in the class. Whether you do jumping jacks or lunges or a game, that is completely up to you. But we as a district have decided that there will be a gym class. And so that's what I'm wondering about. We're not even to the point now where we are saying there will be a gym class. For some schools and for some kids, that gym class now looks like a worksheet. For some schools and for some kids, that gym class is a live virtual yoga session where the gym teacher is there and for some kids, that looks like a video. Is, do we believe that getting a worksheet or getting a once a week yoga class opportunity is the same? And shouldn't we have as a district some more standardization of expectation and experience and access that is happening? Um, so again, we're, what we are, 
putting out, like for, an, for the example that you gave about a gym class where someone's doing a worksheet and someone's doing yoga or someone's doing watching a video of something else. Um, I, the, my understanding is that there are some clear expectations going out. Now, if someone is using a worksheet for a gym class, we need to know about that. And not because anyone's in trouble, but because that obviously means to me that that person needs support in figuring out how to do a more appropriate gym class. That makes sense. And that's why we keep having this conversation about like, if there's a concern about an instructional practice, go directly to the teacher, to the guidance let, counselor. Let, to let the me build on that, Nicole. Let me build on that. I, I agree. Challenges. Yeah. Sorry, Nicole. I'm sorry. I, let me build on that because I agree with that. Because what, what is underlying this, uh, your question, Julie, I believe, is a sense that if the district says do X, Y, and Z, that will happen. Okay. And what we've been working on with the principals and, and it is a fact of life of the culture of the district, district is if the district says that, that actually won't result in people doing a lot of things different. It will result in a lot of consternation and blowback. Okay. The most effective way for folks to, to, to as, as Nicole just said, if you have a teacher who is struggling with this approach, okay. And it only put and it can only put together, you know, something minimal, say, for whatever reason. Okay, they could be sick. They could be also dealing with many children at home. They could be have you know a parent they're 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 supporting. Uh, they could be this could be brand new to them and they just don't know how to do it. Okay, something coming from me or Nicole actually doesn't help that person. Something coming from their principal and vice principal and perhaps a literacy coach or ET or an ETF. Okay is actually what can help that person, help support that person to do a better job. Okay. So I think fundamentally, it's about a theory of, of change and a recognition of the culture of our schools. And what we know and what the principals have been adamant about, and, and I again, I agree with them, okay? I'm not putting them, I'm not, I wanna put this on them, okay? Is that a much more effective way to continue to strengthen this is by working that way, as opposed to um, me making some directive. What type of oversight structure is in place? It just strikes me as a bit backwards for it to be incumbent upon parents to report to an administrator or the teacher that they feel that there is a, a lack of meaningful engagement for their child. Shouldn't uh, the administration be cognizant of what each teacher is providing just from a knowledge perspective? Uh, I, I, I know that Principals are very aware of what's happening, what each teacher is doing, first of all. Um, but I think it's important to remember that in any given class of 20 kids or so, you'll have some parents who think it's way too much and some parents who, th who think it's not enough. So there is, in, in many ways, um, and also another, another example we have is parents reporting a teacher isn't doing, isn't assigning enough work, but they're also getting a different report from, from their child than what's actually happening from the teacher. So I'm not, I'm not trying to call, it, call anybody out, but in order to really um, assess what's ha what's, uh, whether someone is satisfied or dissatisfied, you, it does. it is helpful actually to hear from a parent if they have concerns, because um, you may be hearing from 90% you know, of that class that doesn't have concerns, um, or you might be hearing silence, uh, so I am very confident that principals have a very, very good idea of what their teachers are doing, but that doesn't mean that everyone's satisfied with it. So I understand I know that the principals are also, also bumping into going into live classrooms. They're checking plans. They are working with um, with um, teachers in grade level teams, working on the planning process, and I mean you. Again, and not to be the dead horse, but you hear that people are making progress, and that's what we can, you know, hang our hat on. No one is stagnant in this moment. And I can add, David, to your question. Um, ETFs are running weekly uh, pupil support meetings where they meet with the entire special ed staff, and they're going over what's getting out to kids. 
So I know I know that we do have a lot of left of the meeting. So I will punt this conversation to the task force for tomorrow. But I, I think that there is this still a very important conversation of what are those kind of uh, the district, like you're saying, Ben, some parents might think one thing, some parents might be another, but I think that we as a district have to decide that this is the place that, you know, and have those conversations of like, well, where in this on the whole, we need more, we need less, where is the place that we are aiming for? And then some children might not be able, you know, some families might not be able to participate. Some families um, might still wish there were more, but that we have, we as a district have said in this time, this is what we are striving for. And so, you know, I, I will, will punt this conversation to, to tomorrow for the task force, but I am asking, and as we've been talking about that, this conversation happen, and hopefully that and continue to happen. Cause I know it's been happening um, and work is being made and progress is being made, uh, but so that's where, where we're kind of at. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure what people expect the task force to do at this point. I mean, the point of the task force was to be very helpful in a two-way communication function so that the district was going to come up with its plans. And then we were going to present it to the task force, get feedback. You know, the working group was going to meet for several hours every day for, you know, many, many days. I, the working group hasn't been meeting. I, we don't have anything to you know, besides the learning expectations, we don't really have anything to give the task force tomorrow. So I'm certainly happy to have this conversation. I, I expect it to go pretty similarly to the conversation we're having right now, because I think that, you know, what people want to hear is, Desi put out a 25 page document last Friday. What are we doing, right? They want to hear the learning expectations piece we can talk to them about. I think that's great. Um, but they want to hear, so, okay, Desi says we're, the bare minimum, right, is that we're supposed to be prioritizing meaningful connections between educators and peers, and that includes starting blocks of synchronous time in morning meetings. It includes synchronous weekly advisory group meetings. It includes regular teacher office hours, individual calls to students from educators and staff checking in. Like there's a whole, there's 25 pages of this. So I think people wanna know how are we, what's our plan to execute against some of this? And I think we've heard really great conversations today and a lot of really good examples I'm not sure I've heard how that answer to that question. I mean, I think that is the question that parents have been asking for six weeks. And, and I think we've got a lot of good, really, really good examples. And I think what we don't have is a plan for how, what strategies we're asking people to do and what we're, how we're measuring it. Um, I mean, there's a whole part in the DESI thing from last Friday about data collection. Are we measuring student engagement? Are we, um, are we disaggregating by uh, race and income? Are we disaggregating by race and income the the people who are and aren't getting um, services and who aren't aren't engaging? So I think there's a lot in there, and I think people just want to hear how it's going, what are how we're gonna how we're gonna make that happen. So. So I'm sorry. So I'm just going to chime in. Uh, I, I don't have anything new to add that the two of you haven't already brought up, but I think it's the, con the conversation that we continue to be having in the district among families in the community, um, wanting to sort of know what the district's direction is um, more specifically. So just chiming in. Yeah, I, I just expect we're going to have the, the conversation we are having now. I expect we will have it tomorrow at 8.30 in the morning with PTO presidents, where they're going to, I, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what I, what else I can say. Mm -hmm. when I'm, and I'm unclear as far as like a plan, you know, as a planning guidepost sort of thing, what we do as school committee to, to set, you know, do we need another meeting in a week to say, let's take, you know, I don't, I'm unclear as to how we keep this moving forward because again, it's great that we're having progress, um, but I do feel some like this is that we are we're butting up again, you know, we're, we're, that we're not we're making progress in some ways and that we're not making progress in some ways. Um, yes, Barbara, you had wanted to add something? Yes, I did. I, I think 
that these questions, this question exists, it exists among parents, it exists among many people. But when I think about it, I think this is not so different from what goes on in any school year. A parent from Baker might get together with a parent from Coolidge Corner School, and they start talking about what their fourth graders are doing. They realize that in one place, the teacher is doing X, Y, and Z, and it sounds wonderful. And the other parent says, well, I'm not so happy with what's going on. Teaching is not something that is a rote activity. A lot of it depends on the teacher, the teacher's experience, the group, the interaction of the group, et cetera, et cetera. And we could be asking this exact same question about what was going on during the school year. Why is this happening here and not happening here? And I think we look hard at what people have said tonight, principals in large part, and, and Casey and the people who have been here talking about special ed kids and realizing Again, that people are getting better, they're doing better, it's not going to be perfect. But it never is across the whole system. And you're thinking about, well, how are things being done? And do we have a plan? And should everybody do this? Well, even if we did, that doesn't mean uh, that doesn't mean that should happen, that that could happen, because People are so different in how they teach and what they do and what their skill level is. And I think we could talk about this from now until the middle of next year, and we still would not necessarily come up with an answer that everybody was satisfied with. And I think that what we have to do is get people to the point where they're saying, yes, this is a very difficult time. These teachers are having a very difficult time. They are doing what they can. And yes, we would like everything to be done really well. We hope that can happen as much as possible. But I think we have to be that we could say, this is what you need every day. And some people would do it, and some wouldn't. And yes, we would have said it. And maybe we would feel good about it. But I'm not sure it would make a big difference. Sorry to be so depressing, but I think that's the truth. Right. So we will. We will. I, have, I have one other question, though, because I keep hearing, like, oh, you know, things are improving. We hear that they're improving. We're seeing improvements in our experiences. Well, you know, some folks are seeing improvements. But, and is the but that it's not happening fast enough? It's not. What, what's the but? but I'll, I'll answer for what I, what I think, uh, what I'm hearing from community members um, is consistency um, across schools and, and across grades. I think it's an issue of, consist, of consistency. So like Barbara said, people are talking to each other and they're having very different experiences, and 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 but yes, I agree that by nature of, of education and teachers, that they're, everybody's a different person, I and mean, that's part of the greatness of of education is the personal connection, and and you learn something different from each teacher that you have. I mean, there's you, and we can't recreate that. Um, but I think that that there's I think that there's a lot of anxiety generally in the community, and I think you know people are trying to wrap their hands around what education looks like for their children and. And so they're hearing different stories about what the experiences are. And, um, and, and there are examples where it varies widely. Um, and I think what I'm hearing, I'm, I'm trying to sort of process everything that I've been hearing tonight. And I think there's a lot of really amazing, awesome stuff going on in this district. I know my children are having a really good experience. Um, I also know that I'm hearing from people who are not really sure that um, their kids are getting what they need or what they want, and the, maybe those are two different things. Um, so I think it's the consistency among grade levels or with it or across the district. And so sounds like when I'm listening to Julie talk that um, 
there's a, an idea of sort of like, this is what as a district we're striving for. This is sort of like what we're hoping educators can get to or be at. Um, and that's not a bar to hold people back from what they can do, but we're hoping that at some point we can build our capacity to be, everybody is, is doing sort of this piece. And, and maybe that's something the coordinators work on together with, you know, Office of Teaching and Learning. I don't know. I, I mean, that this is the question that I come to, led Julia. I don't know where school committee, like, what, where do we go with this conversation? And, and I don't, I don't know what that balance is between school committee and the school district. Um, sorry, and I, it's like ten oh nine, and I'm, I'm sorry, but it's, I, it's getting late. Um, we have a lot of items on the agenda. I'm not sure if we're going to be able to do all of them. Just throw that out there. Mm -hmm. well, Mr. Gillis has been waiting very patiently for his piece, and I think we should at least accomplish that tonight. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's do that, Matt. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for participating for this long. Um, and being in your office still. So. I I know. No problem. <laughs> Are you in, you're in your office? Yes. Either that or he has a lot of fluorescent lighting in his house. <laughs> I'm so tired. I wasn't. Thank you, Matt, for being so patient and waiting with us till 10.09 at night. Well, I really, I, I really didn't want to get in the car and then the, the catharsis stopped and, <laughs> and, and then have to try to do it, like pull over and try to do this. So I'm so I stayed. Um, you know, uh, just a moment to Michael Glover. Michael, you're smart, kind, supportive, appropriately inquisitive, respectful of other people's time. That made you the right person for the job, and that's why you're going to be missed. Um, <laughs> I'd like to get into. Thank you, Matt. Quick, you're welcome. This is sweet. <laughs> I, ho I, hope, I hope some people were taking notes on how quickly that was done. Um, <laughs> I want to try to do this quickly. The right thing here is to keep the transportation providers in business so that we can comply with the law and get the kids to school, both in district and out of district, and we're required to do so. And I know this is cumbersome and it hits a couple laws against one another. And it, it actually costs a lot of money to pay for what I'm going to call standby service. But I think that's what we need to do. Uh, we have a tentative agreement that's been um, vetted and approved by uh, town's legal counsel because um, Eastern Bus Company didn't have any edits or changes to the agreement. We agreed on two rates, 70% of the per diem rate for regular bus service, 63% for the Metco bus service. And I have a, a tentative agreement on a percentage with the van company, YCN, at 63%. If you recall, they, they were at 95% uh, at the last meeting. And then on Tuesday, they had an epiphany and shared the rate of 63% with all of their uh, school clients. So they're, they're offering everybody the same rate. And in conversations I've had with folks, then they intend to pay and, and bring it forward to their school committee. For the big yellow buses, almost everybody is, is, has agreed, or they, they also had school committee members this week. Some people are starting to cut checks. So we have reason to believe that if everybody's doing this together, the vendor will stay in business. And when we need them uh, in September, they're gonna be there and ready to go. I guess I'll take questions at this point. I have a very quick question, Matt. So if they end up furloughing their drivers because not enough people paid their part to keep the drivers in, we then not pay so is this we're paying because we they have told us that this is what it needs for them to pay their driver to keep their drivers on the payroll if they don't keep their drivers on the payroll do we no longer pay the executives or their profit or whatever it is? so they're they're they're, they're two different things the main thing is to keep them in business in in the, in the case of eastern bus their drivers couldn't get through the unemployment lines to collect unemployment and the owner put them back on payroll. He submitted certified payrolls with his bills that he has been paying them. And I can call some drivers and probably check and verify since we have their phone numbers and there's not that many of them. Um, the, the van company put their folks on uh, furlough 
and is not able to pay them and they haven't been paying them, but their folks did get through and they furloughed them, I guess, quicker um, or sent them to unemployment quicker. They did get through the unemployment lines. At least that's what we're told. I haven't verified that with all of them. And they're collecting their $600 uh, COVID stimulus money for a period of time where they're actually being paid more than they would be if they were actually working. But they understand that that is going to be a short lived process and they have weekly contact with the drivers because a lot of the drivers want to come back to work because they know it's 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 not going to last forever so in this sense the 63 percent covers the special ed companies costs <laughs> and the 70 percent is covering the regular ed, uh, transportation companies cost so that they can stay in business they're just going about it a different way uh, they're, they're different business models so the big yellow buses don't go home with the drivers. They go to a yard. The yard has to be paid for. In in the uh, van model, the the vans go home with the drivers. They get it as a benefit. They just turn off their gas card when when they're not uh, transporting in school. So the drivers are using the the van still for you know their own personal use, but they pay for their own gas. So it they're, they're reasonably different in most if not all of our um, colleagues and school systems that have these same same companies we're trying to do this together um, and that's that's kind of where we're at so so yes it's a little bit different but the main goal we have good reason to believe that what they're asking for because they want to stay in business and we want them to stay in business it is what will work to get them through through next september <laughs> Anyone else have any questions or comments? Yes, uh, earlier you referenced that there are two competing laws. Uh, I have been made aware that one of these laws essentially says that a town is not supposed to approve of an expenditure if we did not receive services rendered. You reference us in conflict with another uh, regulation and that also town councils looked over this and it's okay with moving forward. Can you elaborate on that a little more? So town council has looked over it and um, nobody is really thrilled with it because it's a competing law, but the consequences of the laws are quite different. If you pay a bill that you shouldn't have paid, the auditor puts that in the finding, sends it into the state, and then the state sends a letter and tells you, don't do that again. You know, in this case, it wouldn't have been an accident. It'd be delivered. If you're required to pick up the kids and transport them to school and you outsource that and your, your contractor goes out of business, it's still your responsibility to find a way to, to make that happen. If there's going to be a scramble for filling that void, that's gonna to be tough. And think of how the parents and the students will feel when they're supposed to go back to school and they think things are gonna be back to normal. And then the parent has to turn around and come home because it's 30 minutes after school started and the kids call and saying, the bus didn't come, it didn't pick me up. Like, I think we want to avoid that if at all costs, and not, especially if, if we can and we should try to keep our partner in business because if we were doing this ourselves and they were our employees, we would have been paying them or paid them at a reduced rate or, or something to that effect so that they would return to work when we needed them to return to work. So, I mean, I, I view it as an extension of that because it's just, we can't educate them if we can't get them there. And in some end, we're obligated, whether it be special ed co uh, contracts or, the, or state law for public education under grade seven and the distance that they live from school to transport them there. And then also, as I recall you pointing out at a finance subcommittee meeting, almost every other district that has a contract with Eastern Bus is doing the same as you're proposing, correct? Yeah, we, we talk a couple of times a week now to, to check in and see where everybody's at. You know, it, first it was kind of like, well, who's going to be first? I don't want to be last. And now it's, it's pretty much everybody's on board. 
Did, um, has the decision been made about what would happen or what is going to happen for the families who have been asked or who would traditionally pay for the bus service and now for the period of time that they haven't needed the bus? Have we made any decisions about what would happen there? No, but that's a nice segue into this. So we have uh, collected a bus fee uh, from folks and they're not getting one th approximately one third of the service, about 36%. Um, I think we should refund them, but you know, with everything else uh, going on, I've only had one request come in uh, so far and it was the other day. I think we should refund them because we have the ability to, to refund them between what's left in the revolving fund and what's left in the general fund. And that would be right around $17,000. And so duly also is that we can't come to the committee to request a refund if we still have 100% of our costs. You know, so part of it is fixing or sort of settling what we're doing with the school bus, yellow school bus is tied to that next step that you'll get a request from us to um, reduce and refund a portion of the fee. Okay, so I was just wondering if it would, it's good to hear it's that way. I was wondering if it goes in the opposite of if we're paying them anyways, are we going to ask families to incur that or a percentage of that cost that we're paying for this time period? It sounds like no. The answer is there will be cost savings from what we budgeted and your recommendation would be to refund families. We're able yeah. to get that out of the cost savings. Mm -hmm. any, any further questions? Can you just remind me where are those cost savings coming from? What is the cost saving? Because we don't pay 100% of the bus ah. contract because this is the, the vote that we're being asked to make is to pay 63% of the remaining contract amount for this these months. Yep. So we were planning on paying 100%, so we will be paying less than expected. Helen, you're muted. It's 63% for one and 70 for the other. Um, you know, I think we've gone round robin on this a number of times. Um, I did speak with the Newton uh, School Committee member who said they're, they're working on it too. I think they may even be voting tonight, I'm not sure. Um, our staff is telling us this is what they think. I know that Matt drives a hard bargain <laughs> in things. And so he wouldn't be bringing this to us if he didn't think this was the right, uh, the right thing. I think, you know, we, we just have to make a decision and it's not an easy one because we know what we're facing. We know we're going to have, you know, cuts next year. We know that, you know, our budget, even for this year, there's, there's uh, some, uh, well, I don't know. We'll, we'll probably hear that in just a minute. Um, it's a really hard decision, you know, but if we have to, and then what if next year we don't, you know, we still are in the same position where we're doing remote learning. You know, what happens then? That's one of the reasons why this is tied only to this fiscal year. I mean, if we're going to be out a whole year or, you know, another extended period of time, the committee might, might want to make a different decision. I might have a different recommendation. Mm-hmm. Do, do we have an update as to whether they are going to uh, Eastern Bus is going to sign our eight-year extension? Yes, uh, I received that today. Um, they signed it, and with the language that I added that um, and negotiated with, with the owner, that they'd be willing to um, review uh, negotiating down a lower price for next year in August. He just wants to see how everything else comes in. He, he would have. We could have moved the 70 to 68 percent. I'd rather see if I can get one or two percent off the next year in 10 months as opposed to one or two percent for uh, this year in three and a half months. Yeah. All right, so does someone have a motion? I guess I'll make the motion that we, we go ahead with what Matt um, put forward in the memo to us. Do we have a second? Second. Oh, second. David? All right, any further discussion? 
I just I just wanted to I'll be voting no. And I just wanted to say that it's you know not for lack of appreciation for all of the effort that you put into it, Matt, and negotiating it. I just am incredibly concerned about the deficit that we're going to have in this year to cover additional expenses that we're going to have. And I'm really having a hard time with wrestling, you know, when we're needing to make cuts, where do those come, where do those come from and how do we how do we find, how do we come up with that money in this year? So I just wanted to just state that because we're not allowed to talk when we're actually voting. All right, um, so I, with, if nothing, there's no further discussion, I will move through. Uh, Ms. Fetterspiel? Well, I'm abstaining. Okay. Uh, Ms. Monopoly? You come back to me, I'm thinking. Mr. Perlman? Yes. Uh, Ms. wolf Dickoff. Yes. Uh, Ms. Charlepsky? A reluctant, yes. Ms. Scotto? Yes. Mr. Glover? Yes. Okay, um, the, the chair is voting no. And then Ms. Monopoly, that brings us back to you. I don't like this vote. I don't like this decision at all. It's not an answer, I know. Um, it's just for this year, right, Matt? It's just for this year. It, it ends with the 180 day school year this year. And just so folks understand, we don't actually, we wouldn't release payment on any bit on any bills until like the month was closed. Um, well, we have the votes anyway, so yes. Okay. So the vote of six to one to one, that vote pass, that motion passes. Ugh. Ugh. <laughs> I had that. I had that feeling throughout this whole process. I don't like this. I don't like. I don't even. I don't know. I don't know. This is. We just have so many tough. De it's like tough decision after tough decision. All right. Uh, thank you, Matt. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here until ten twenty for this. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, Matt. No All right. That yeah. brings us back to that conversation on. Let's start with the FY twenty twenty budget. Mary Ellen, if you could give us just a brief update on where things are at. Is there an update in the folder? Is there a new document yeah. on this? Yeah, uh, yes, there's a third quarter report in uh, probably two, fold, two different folders. I think I put in two places, same report. Um, we are currently projected um, to be at, at the end of the third quarter at a roughly about a million four. Um, in the whole, um, primarily, um, those are all related to um, our pandemic expenses. Um, the lion's share of that um, is is um, funding and paying for the beep uh, staff out of the revolving fund, uh, the rental facilities custodians, um, and um, a small portion for. Uh, or beep, uh, sorry, for um, athletics. Um, um, athletics started issuing refunds for the spring sports uh, this week. And so um, they were fine as, as I finished up this report, but noticed that the refunds started going through. So I have, I'll have some work and monitoring to do there. Um, the other piece of um, dollar amounts that are in the report, um, that I have, um, I have held about a half a million dollars in uh, expense funds, um, actually more than that, probably about $700,000 in expense funds, um, 200,000 for um, unanticipated special education expenses that um, Casey No Miller needs access to for between now and the end of June for Supports. I'm meeting with her and Mike D'Onofrio next week. I hope to fine tune that number. Um, hopefully that will be cut in half. So that will reduce our deficit. Um, also holding, um, there's roughly about 250,000 in um, expenditures that are, I know are coming in related to um, purchases um, in the, that are unapproved requisitions. Um, and then I'm keeping at this point $250,000 in um, 
unknown invoices for goods and services that were procured without a purchase order. Um, so the secretaries need to come back, um, go through mail um, and locate invoices and people need to turn over invoices. Um, we are, um, so that needs to happen um, in the next month of May um, to clear that. And so roughly, you know, our, our deficit can drop um, pretty, pretty quickly um, once I no longer have to hold these funds back. Um, the numbers are from basically what I've had to, what I've dealt with in fiscal year closing since um, I started doing them in 2018. Um, and um, I think that's an, enough with that. The, the final page kind of breaks down the page that you'd seen previously um, of the report of the COVID-19 expenses specifically. Um, I don't have any date uh, or known date on when we would be reimbursed um, for the MEMA and FEMA applications the town is putting in for our expenditures. So um, that will also help and assist our um, deficit uh, for custodial overtime and cleaning su services and supplies that Here's, we're supporting police and fire. What are those amounts that we've put in those the for custodians for MEMA and FEMA? Um, roughly there's 75,000. Uh, 54,000 for food service. Um, we have roughly 150,000 in supplies and cleaning services. I'm just trying to go through and figure it's out. 351,000 um, really would be potential. 350, 300,000 would be roughly about what we'd be looking for from a re reserve fund transfer from the town and or a claim a reimbursement for MEMA and FEMA funds. So if we have 300,000 from MEMA and FEMA and an expected 250,000 back from special education funds, there are other places where you think this 1.4 might change? Um, yeah, as payroll sort of finish um, and we complete those, uh, we complete um, the confirmation of stipend payments, um, those are there's a some of those are um, queuing up to be paid in May and June. Um, we should be able to start seeing this um, drop and decline. Uh, will we get to zero? Uh, that would be uh, we would get get pretty close, but not. I doubt we're going to get to zero. So, when um, you, so you think we will get pretty close to zero? How close to so? How close? Um, probably within uh, probably within a half a million, two hundred fifty half a million dollars, which is less than a half a percent. Where, where does that money come from? So that money, um, that's a discussion I'm beginning. I've I've started with um, Melissa Goff. Um, that has to do with how the select board is going to fund um, deficits. Um, so the, there, there are a couple different mechanisms that the town can use use for that. Um, so that I imagine will be emerging um, as we hear about a variety of um, stimulus funds that uh, municipalities are eligible for. And do we have any built in? We've heard about like speech and language pathologists um, needing PD and bringing in potentially someone for that. And are there other PD costs that we have on this? Or is that what? Um, I, um, Nicole and Casey and Ben and Khalees will are keeping me informed with the different requests that are coming through. Um, and they're evaluating, senior staff is evaluating those requests in terms of what they're essential, how they're essential, and um, they're letting me know kind of what those um, estimated costs are, and I will let them know where we are with our um, our budget projection and whether we have funds or don't have funds. Marilyn, can I just jump in real quick? Um, sure. Some of this, too, is because I have... Um, scheduled settlement conferences um, with the Bureau of Special Ed Appeals uh, between now and June 30th. And so uh, when we meet with Mary Ellen, 
we have to talk about once these settlements are agreed to, is the money coming out of FY20 um, or 21? And then are there other, I guess the other um, unexpected, unexpected COVID costs, you said you have an item, a line item that's built in for that. That's where those would fall? So that would come, I don't know if that question was from Mary Ellen, but the both the uh, training for the SLPs um, and settlements would come from our reserve line. In this COVID budget or reserve line in just your general every year special education budget? It's our every year uh, special education budget. So Casey, I put 200,000 in my report right. for that. Yeah, yeah. So Casey and I, you're talking about the same dollars, source, source and dollars, just, you know, and, and the tough part is that there are some options. Um, so for example, um, the committee could potentially look at um, suspending or delaying uh, the vacation buybacks that are part of a number of different contracts. Um, um, and or renegotiating those um, could look at furloughing, uh, could look at any number of different options around mitigating costs. Um, I, I went after the expense accounts. So we froze the budget on April 8th. Um, so I, put, I um, went after those accounts um, because we were still experiencing and sort of regrouping about what our staff and um, employees were working on. Um, so with that, um, that's not quite covering all of um, all of our payroll needs. Um, but as we go through every payroll gets, it, you know, we fine tune that number. Um, and roughly there, there are roughly eight to nine payrolls left for the rest of the fiscal year. Any other questions? So um, I think one of the things that we're going to need to have a very clear answer on is which line items we have been able to either reduce or save um, through COVID. If the answer is none of them and they've gone up, I think we're going to have it's going to be a we're going to have to think differently about that conversation because I think that that is not intuitive to a lot of people, and so we're going to have to figure out how to explain um, things that seem obvious, like why would you need substitutes? We don't have substitutes. Or why would you need supplies? They're not using crayons. Or why would you, I think there's just sort of a why, you know, why do you? And I think there are a lot of those. And I think we're going to need to figure out a narrative that explains those. Um, I don't know if you want to do it, it certainly not at 1030 at night, but we could, we could try it, you can sort of have that conversation next week at finance. Um, but anyway, I think we're going to have to figure that out. And I think, and I think we probably need some options, Mary Ellen, just as you said, of this is what it would look like to be more aggressive. Like this is the next set of things you'd go after. Um, mm -hmm. So, and if we do end up being, um, you know, if we end up, if we end the year, you know, 250, you know, that's one thing. But if we have already tapped out all the sources that we use to get that 250, um, it's a different conversation. Um, so I'm not worried in the abstract about a 250 or 500. There's always, you know, at the end of the year, things you have to clean up. But it, but it kind of depends on how many of those go-to places did we already sort of empty out. And I think we just need a better sense of that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well yeah, well, specifically to substitutes, I included in the memo that today's balance in the substitute account is 98,000. So we have historically underfunded that line, um, yep. expecting the unit A line to kind of cover that, and it hasn't really been doing that. So that's oh, a yeah. perfectly logical place. Like, I was hoping that it would be a lot more, but it actually surprised me between the second quarter and the third quarter, you know, we were we still went through two to three hundred thousand dollars of substitutes um, in a quarter in a three month period. So, um, the um, and the supplies and materials and expense lines, um, those two also freezing all of those. Um, those are exactly our crayon lines, our you know, materials lines, things like that. Um, that um, 
we're mining. My team, um, Donna Chisholm and Peggy Lee, are are talking with secretaries and mining the open PO list um, and liquidating those as we can. Um, so yeah, we can talk about more more sort of next steps and more drastic steps um, and measures to then you know take to shave this shave this down um, and really get things fine tuned um, going into April and May in the last pay, the last few payrolls. Yeah, I mean, I think that to the extent that revenue for this year is not going to come in like this year, right? So nine C, you know, our equivalent of nine C cuts. Um, to the extent that revenue is not going to come in for us this year as a town the way we would have expected, um, and you know, there are multi-million-dollar numbers that people are throwing around. I don't, I don't have a number, but that's what I'm hearing. What, you know, what is that? I think we need to have confidence that we have done everything we possibly can to get our number down in, you know, short of truly noxious, you know, choices. And I think we sort of have to show people like, here is the set of things that we tightened up on and here's where we stopped. Here's the set of things that we just didn't, we didn't go for those because those were too, too hard, right? Too harsh. Um, and, you know, different people might have different judgments on that, but I think unless we show, unless we satisfy ourselves that we've done our mm -hmm. diligence, I think it's going to be harder to communicate with other other entities, mm -hmm. some other entities. Yeah. So uh, we can do that Monday if you want, or Wednesday if you want. Um, but we can do it when you're ready. The next meeting is fine. Okay. Any further questions on FY 2020? Then, uh, Ben, that brings us to the conversation on F the FY 2021 budget. Great. So, um, hold on. Um, so, uh, last week of the finance subcommittee, I provided a preliminary balance budget with details of some of the necessary reductions to balance the budget at that point. The reductions I outlined to the finance committee uh, and shared with you before uh, were reasonable target adjustments designed to make a very limited impact across our schools. Uh, as of now, we've been able to make some minimal targeted cuts. However, I'm much more concerned about further cuts that will have to be made because of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economy. As requested by members of the advisory committee and the school committee tonight, I will not go into further detail on the budget I presented last week because that preliminary budget doesn't take into account the impact of the pand pandemic on the economy and our rapidly changing fiscal outlook. Um, we anticipate town and state revenues to be hit hard will have an impact on the school budgets. Um, as you all know, and the community needs to know, further cuts are coming. Um, we expect to get more, as, as shared at the town school partnership meeting a few weeks ago and reiterated at the, at the finance subcommittee meeting, I think last week, we expect to get more details from the town administrator and deputy uh, town administrator by May 15th. Prior to getting those numbers from them, we are beginning to plan different scenarios so we can act quickly on developing the final budget once we get more information from the town and can be uh, prepared or you know moving towards being prepared for town meeting in June. Um, so uh, we'll talk more about this as we uh, develop these scenarios. Um, we don't, as I said, don't know. The latest news we got from the state was that the state budget would be cut 10% or more. Of course, that doesn't directly correlate to any impacts on direct impact that not, there's not a direct correlation between that number and um, an impact on our school's budget. But I just want, I just do want folks to know that the level of, of severity that um, that this state is looking is looking towards. So happy to answer more questions on that at this point, but uh, I don't see the need and was asked not to go into detail about the preliminary uh, balanced budget I presented last week because it is in many ways uh, out of date. Any any questions or comments at this time? So I think what would be helpful, and I sent this in email and sent this in an email to Mary Ellen earlier this week, is for the committee to start wrapping their heads around 
significantly bigger numbers than what we've been wrapping our heads around so far. So for example, um, it's not, let's, the state is gonna be at 10%, we will be at 10%, let's say we're at five, I don't know, pick a number, and schools end up taking two and a half percent. I mean, on our on budget, like, you know, our budget, two and a half percent is a lot of money. And so I just think that until we are talking about bigger chunks, and maybe it needs to start an executive session because there are, um, you know, issues of, you know, there are a number of issues that are related to those kinds of dollars. Um, that's fine, but I just, I, I think we need some sort of agreement or some, some sense from the committee as to when, when and how the full committee wants to be involved versus the finance committee in starting to, again, grapple with bigger numbers. And again, you guys have the prioritized list that we've been working on so far, um, which we need to go back to. Um, so we need to, so it seems to me that if we're gonna, it'd be helpful for me to understand what your, what your vision is for how we do this over the course of May. Yeah, so um, so you're right. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, we've done the legwork all, you know, over many months to be prepared for for this and you know for better or for worse. Um, what I will what we'll do is we'll we will prepare scenarios and provide you with um, balanced budget scenarios based on different levels of cuts. Um, and, uh, and and present it rather than rehashing or going over or redoing all the conversations we've had. Uh, I don't see the need for that. Uh, we've gotten plenty of input, um, but that's what we'll do instead is to give you a balanced budget with proposed um, cuts um, uh, as soon as we can. Uh, we'll begin that scenario plan, like I said, or we have begun that scenario planning, um, but won't finalize it until we get some real numbers from the know um from the uh town but the work that we'll do prior to that will allow us to turn that around quite quickly once we do get some co more concrete numbers from the town so i'm not really clear on our timeline but maybe oh, maybe Suzanne. so as, as susan as, as you've heard from at the town school partnership that um they are waiting for april receipts and that they would not give us firmer numbers until may 15th and so that's a timeline i'm operating on until you're different Sorry, no, I'm in our scenario timeline, starting to wrap our heads around what numbers like that could look like. Again, not not committing to any particular number, but I just yep. So when we hear a, to go when between we, now and that conversation, even I guess is what I'm trying yep. to say. When we hear a range, we'll make sure we share it with you. And that and that's okay. That the, I guess I'm saying that doesn't feel to me that doesn't feel. I feel like we need to have that conversation sooner. I think that sooner rather than later. We need to be having a conversation going back to the prioritized list and thinking if the number is in the 2 million range, if the number is in the 5 million range, just to start to have the conversation. If no one else wants to do it, that's fine. I, just, I think waiting till mid May until we get numbers from the town and then starting the school committee process feels late to me, but, but it's a Susan, I, I agree with you entirely. Okay. And we will, we will get you scenarios, uh, as, soon as we build them, okay, and, um, okay, I'm not sure what else you need. Uh, the, okay, Susan, right, as of right now, we don't have our next, or as of right now, our next meeting is not until May 14th. So just something as a full committee, we may, either this conversation can start taking place at finance, perhaps, I'm not sure where the best, the best place for it is, um, but as of, as of right now, our next meeting is not until mid-May. Just right. Finance is Wednesday. We don't have an executive session docketed, but we could. Um, so I kind of get to the group to hear. The other piece that we have to keep in mind, I mean, we need to have these scenarios because you need to be able to um, allow people to know by May 15th whether we're going to have any reductions in source. So we can't wait until the town gives us the number on the 15th. I, I, I guess I'm not being clear. I'm saying yeah. we're doing scenario planning now. Yes. Okay. We'll have that done before the 15th. And yes. then we have to adjust that scenario planning based on what we hear from the town. Okay. So I, I'm not, I, I, I don't, so we're working on scenario planning now. You will see it. I, I, you will not have anything by this Wednesday. Okay. But if you want something by the, by another finance subcommittee meeting the following week, you know, we can get that to you. Um, 
I just, Ben, I, I just want to, I know that we are all in one continuous day that feels like a hundred days in every one. I just want to point out that there is no longer a Wednesday in this week. And so that next week, next Wednesday would be the sixth and the following week would be our school committee meeting. And so do you think that the sixth, we would be ready with scenario planning to start discussing on the sixth? No. So the following week is the week of our 14th school committee meeting. It is indeed. Yes, Suzanne, and then Jennifer, are you puzzling or you have your hand up? But Suzanne first. Well, I, you know, I just want to remind us that this will be across the board, if depending on what those numbers are, uh, including central office. So it's, it's, we don't know exactly, but it's going to be bigger than what we had probably thought, perhaps by quite a bit. Also, I'd like to suggest that schools be involved uh, again with what they need to do at their school level. So I just said I would recognize people ask me just to mention, I know at Lawrence, they're concerned about reduction of staff. And I, I think that we are not in a position where we can say yes or no to a particular position or staff person. And that should be, we should get that information from the schools. Those decisions should be impacted by the schools. Uh, and so we need to think about that. Suzanne, I just want to clarify when you're saying schools, are you asking, you're asking about then whether principals, the school leaders, the principals are involved in this consideration, or you're wanting the entire school committee, just the school community to be involved in individual decisions about the school? I think I want the school site council or the school councils to be involved with their budgeting advice. That's their role is to advise on their school budget. I, I don't know that that is, I don't know, we'll have to, as a committee, I guess we need, we're, we need to have input on that. I don't think that we have the mechanisms in place in order for that input to happen in the next two weeks. I would highly recommend it. I don't know if it's feasible, but I think I would highly recommend that school councils think about how they might have some input into this. Depending on, you know, I don't know how much the cuts are going to be, but it's important that they have a say in, in what the cuts are. Jennifer, I, you agree, I agree with Suzanne, and I think it's a good idea that we at least try to create a mechanism by which the school site councils could try to provide relatively prompt feedback. If we could reach out to the school site councils, encourage them to set up meetings within the next uh, week to 10 days or so, so that hopefully by the 14th, we would have input from each school building. And I think this is especially important because a controversial subject such as uh, literacy coaches. At some schools, it seems like they really like literacy coaches. At other schools, it seems like there's not as much enthusiasm. So being able to kind of have that feedback on a school by school basis, I think would be useful when we are going to be needing to make contingency plans for uh, possibly significant cuts. Yeah, this is, it's a tough conversation. That's a tough conversation to have because as we're looking at things, it goes back to the conversation we were having earlier about learning expectations and having very different experiences from school to school. If we are starting to make those sorts of um, decisions of having literacy coaches at one school or having world language at another school you know, I, I don't, I worry having seen this, you know, even having had some of the conversation and getting some of the feedback that we're receiving about inconsistency of experience during this short remote learning period. I just couldn't even imagine what that might look like if we have, if in the next two weeks, we are asking site councils to make decisions about whether one school is going to have world language and another school is going to have art or not. You know, I, I don't know that that is the, the road that we, we as a school committee want to head down in the next two weeks. It just seems. Well, I, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we, that they make the actual decision. It's more, what is your opinion? What would you like to see? 
And then we can look at if there's a pattern that emerges. If seven out of eight schools say X, then that is a good point of information for us. So I see this more as an opportunity for information gathering, uh, similar to the purpose of a survey, just to sort of understand what the landscape is. As you were mentioning earlier in the context of the conversation, is this something that five people think or is it something that hundreds think? And if we have, uh, if certain patterns emerge through this process, that can inform our thinking. Jennifer, had you you did want to speak on something? Yes, and then Jennifer and then Barbara. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I have so many, so many thoughts going on right now. I started trying to write them all down. Um, I also got a number of emails from the Lawrence community. We all got the we got a letter from them as well as other parents who were concerned that the cuts that they were seeing were based at the schoolhouse and there were no cuts to central administration. So that that's one thing. And I know I realize now that we're talking about much there's a potential for much larger numbers on our budget cuts. Um, I, I think we need to we need to think about balance, and I certainly think we need contingency plans well in advance of May 15. We need to know what those contingency plans are going to be for these potential cuts. Um, we need to we need to make plans, and we can't be getting that information at our May 15 meeting. So we need to figure out when we're going to get those plans and at what meeting we're going to get those plans so that we can start to work on this. I mean, we've been working on this budget and we've had a ton of presentations. We've been working on this. It has been a... So folks, I, 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 I guess I, we are ready to put together contingency plans, okay? I guess I'm not sure what well in advance of May 14th is, considering today is basically Friday, okay? And so, I'm saying Wednesday is too soon. Okay, you're saying a week later is too late. So, you know, Monday, Tuesday of that of that, of that next week, I think we can do that by. All right. So I'm not trying to like. I'm just trying to be realistic about what we can deliver. There is a pandemic going on. Okay, it is not easy just to turn around and by Wednesday deliver this. Okay, um, I've got more information to share with you later tonight, and uh, you know so. No, I'm saying Wednesday's too, Wednesday the 6th is too early, and you guys are saying Thursday the 14th is way too late. So what's, um, you know. Can we try for Friday? Friday? Can we try for Friday the 8th, a week from now? Jennifer, I see that you're, you're trying to talk. You're, you're, you're muted. Yeah, je no, you just muted, but your computer's doing something weird. We can't hear you. What Julie was saying was that you're you're going in and out. When you were speaking, it was stopping, and then we could all hear Julie, but you couldn't hear Julie. Weird. There's <laughs> something. You're totally silent. Can you hear us? We can't hear you. I don't. I'm not sure what's happening with Jennifer, only in that I experience, I myself has experienced this a different meeting. Um, Barbara, you were wanting to say something? Yes, um, I am, I, I think we don't have enough time to do the kinds of things we're talking about with school council. I think there's some real issues around school councils getting involved with how money is spent. One of them being equity. Um, I don't want to get into this conversation now. It's a longer conversation. But at this point in time, with the problems we have uh, with, with the uh, COVID virus and with, with the whole financial situation, I don't think we can afford to spend time thinking about how we want our budget to work in the long term. I think that we have forward and make the best choices we can given what we know now. Um, I think that trying to get meetings in the next two weeks and get some some input on this is is not going to be feasible. And frankly I don't think it's such a good idea, but that's neither here nor there right now. But I would not be in favor. 
I would be in favor of letting the administration do what it does and and we will make the decision about whether we agree with them. Okay, so how are we going to land on when are, are we wanting to I think that this conversation should start first round at finance. And so And do we land on, I know that there was a proposal, Helen had made a proposal and then we had trouble with computers. Did we land on trying to make this happen for Friday or is that suggested in? Uh, I would prefer Monday the uh, 11th. Okay. Um, Helen, I mean, uh, Susan being that I'm now talking about finance, does that work for you? Uh, apparently. <laughs> so I will let Susan work with Robin and Mary Ellen and Ben to try to schedule a finance subcommittee meeting for Wednesday. To, and that will have to be an executive. I'm assuming there will be a lot of personnel um, impacts to Wait, this. Wednesday? No, Monday the 11th. <laughs> Sorry. So we're, so, we're, we're canceling Wednesday. We're not going to meet Wednesday and Monday. Okay, so you're going to cancel Wednesday the 6th? Was yeah. this the whole agenda? Yeah. Okay. So then, but it, I think it will have to be scheduled as an executive session for Monday the 11th because it, the, the, they will all have, you know, at this level of cuts there, it's personnel. Well, for, but we'll need both because we need to do FY20 and we'll need to do FY21. So. Okay. Everybody hear me now? I'm just curious. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. No, it's good. I'm glad you're back. <laughs> and you're not calling Helen on your cell phone so that people <laughs> <laughs> um, Anything else on the FY 2021 budget? All right. Um, I'm just going to repeat myself and we don't have to respond to what I'm going to say, but just so that people know what it was that I was going, that I was saying that no one could hear. Um, um, I was talking about, you know, the, all of the the letters and emails. Um, Suzanne mentioned the letter from Lawrence. We've gotten, I've gotten a lot, I'm sure we all have gotten letters from parents in the community concerned about the cuts happening at the schoolhouse level and not the central administration level. And that I, I understand that in the context of this conversation, we're looking at much, potentially much larger cuts. Um, but I just, I just want to acknowledge that that's been a concern. Um, and I was also, um, making uh wanted to encourage us to really have those contingency plans well in advance of the 15th which we have now settled so that's and, just and also just to clarify on that as well in our executive session this evening we already have intended the part of that conversation in discussing so, 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 um, yeah so uh jennifer thanks for bringing that up i i was remiss in saying earlier in my opening that further cuts are coming, and those will certainly include cuts to central office. Um, I, I meant to say that. I did not say that. Um, so I understand this fully. And you'll be seeing a plan coming forward. All right. So that brings us to um, we have 10 minutes allocated for the discussion and review, a second reading and possible vote on the student field trip policy. So I would punt this to the next meeting, but Michael. Well, it's, it's up to you. I mean, somebody else can take it to the finish line or we can just try to do it now. Yeah, let's get, let's try to do it now. Okay. It's 11 uh, o'clock at night, guys, and we still have an executive session? That we do. I, Michael, with all due respect, would you it's be fine. very upset? Someone I know you can, want closure on can, You guys have the final draft? Nobody's taking any field trips this year. Ruth? We can, it's fine to me. I'm not offended. Can you want to come back, Michael? No, someone, you can, someone else. <laughs> yeah, you no can't field leave. trips this year. You, you actually can't leave until the field trip policy is done. So, can I ask a question? Oh, okay. Can I just ask a process question? Is anyone going to vote no on this? Does someone want to have a discussion, or can we just vote? If we can't just vote, I'm with Helen. If we have to have a conversation, let's punt it. But if it may be true that people are just ready to vote without a conversation, having this this 
has been in process for a very long time. You've done so much work on this. Michael, Nicole, everyone, the red lines were clear. Can we vote? I only, the only thing I'm ready to vote yes on it. I just had one uh, community member had reached out with a question. And so I just had one question to convey to see if it has been considered or if we would think that it would be a place in the field trip policy. So happy to make it very quickly and we could vote. Or we could. You can ask a question. I think I know what it is, but ask it. Okay, so the question is with, I guess there were issues with, because field trips were canceled this spring, um, there were issues with getting refunds or not, and whether there was insurance for everyone and whether insurance was required for international trips. And if there's anything in the new field trip policy that re reflects on our current experience because of this massive cancellation, and if that is something that would, would now be improved or changed. So we did consider that as part of this, but we decided not to put it in the policy because those sorts of things can be very case specific. Mm -hmm. um, and you also, you don't know that you can actually always change them. Um, so you could put something in a policy that's effectively going to eliminate opportunities for students to go on trips. It, it, it's too unique and specific to be in a, in a higher level policy. Those sorts of things can be dealt with by the administration and by the, the those who are bringing the field trip forward to be planned in terms of thinking about them, and they should. And I would encourage the administration to really be thoughtful about the experiences that we've had this year in um, thinking about how we, we consider these things going forward and whether that be trip insurance, whether that be not taking certain trips. Um, those are all things that should be considered, but they're not they're not something that we decided to put in this policy. With that said, in order to reiterate, it does not pre prevent anyone from considering those issues. Uh, the policy just lays out sort of the minimum standards um, that we're looking for for, for policy approval. Um, we did insert some language that, that indicated that travel insurance may be required by uh, by central office, uh, but it's not not a requirement. Okay. If I and I would actually, I would actually. Um, venture to add it into the um, procedures right. that um, there's an extensive review, either a requirement for um, trip insurance or um, a real clear um, conversation sign off with families so they know if they opt out of insurance, what that means to them financially if a trip is canceled or something like that. Mary Ellen. Um, also, the review of the contracts with the various trip vendors um, are with all of my peers are under review. We're actually doing a little bit work together in terms of the most frequent uh, vendors we purchased through and what those cancellation termination force mayor clauses are um, to to be sure that um, we can recoup funds that haven't been expended and are getting re you know pulled back from airlines and things like that so there's some work um wholesale around field trips um with students in the school business industry or area all right are we ready to question okay oh, yeah. helen you had a question um, I just want to make sure that in the procedures, you continue to have the piece about if students can swim or not, that that or whether they will be swimming, because there was a, a child who died on a field trip, you know, who went into a pool and the, the people didn't weren't watching. So, yes, we will continue to have that as part of the procedure, part of the procedures and the questionnaire that they fill out. Yeah, okay. I'll move it. Moved. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, great. Um, so let me go through. We have um, Mr. Glover. Yes. Ms. Scotto. Yes, you're saying yes. Okay. Yes. Ms. Charlotte Yes. Ms. wolf -Yetkoff. Yes. Mr. Perlman. Yes. Ms. Monopoly. Yes. Ms. Fetterspiel. Yes. And the chair votes yes as well. So that is unanimous. Look at that, Michael. Look how much you got accomplished here. All right. <laughs> yes, we Thank All right, you. So now, um, Michael, you again, we have a possible vote to approve a one year agreements with the Brookline Educators Union, the BEU units A and B. 
Yeah. So these are these are two separate MOAs um, with the BEU. They cover this fiscal year, this current fiscal year, fiscal year 2020. Um, they provide for a uh, one and a half percent wage increase for the members of of those units. Um, I, I imagine we can vote them together uh, unless somebody tells me otherwise. Um, so I will move both of them for approval. Um, and uh, would anyone like to second? I'll second. Okay. All right. Any discussion? Oh, yes, Helen. You're muted. You have to unmute. The the union has voted the memorandum. Yes, they they've have they have ratified. Ratified. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so the, again, I just just as I did in the last on the last vote that we took before we go ahead and take the vote, I just want to say that I am going to vote no on this again. I think that with the number of extraordinary expenses that we are and will be incurring this year for this year, um, that that I have concerns about having the funds to pay for, for this. Um, and so again, it's not not for lack of, of value or um, appreciation for all the hard work that the teachers are doing, but I just wanted to, to be able to say that that is the reason why I'll be voting no. All right, uh, so we will go through uh, Mr. Glover. Yes. Ms. Scotto. Yes, okay. Uh, Ms. Shurlevsky. Yes. Ms. Wolf Dickhoff. Yes. Mr. Perlman. Yes. Ms. Monopoly. Yes. Ms. Fetterspiel? Yes. And the chair votes no. So in a vote of seven to one, uh, that mo those motions pass. All right, that brings yeah, us- What's our communication strategy about, <clears throat> about having signed a contract? Just a mutually signed a contract? I have not developed one. Um... <laughs> when does your clock run out, Michael? Next week? Uh, I think I'm accelerating it. I think it's in about 10 minutes. <laughs> no, I think there should be some communication. We, we, I haven't talked with, with Ben or, or anyone else about, um, or Julie, uh, about what that communication should be. Um, but certainly it's good news and we should, we should get it out there. I agree. Uh, so Michael, do you, is that something that you're wanting to take on or do you, do we need to, <laughs> Um, designate someone else to take the lead with that. I think we need to designate someone else to take the lead with that. Okay. Just is someone willing to take the lead with that? <laughs> I being the only one who voted against it, someone who voted in favor should be taking the lead with this one. So uh, I think Suzanne can do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm full. I'm busy. All right, we'll, we'll work it out. Let's move on. Okay. Uh, so we have um, hopefully very brief subcommittee and liaison reports. I'm just gonna move through real quick. Feel free to tell me that we've covered everything that you would discuss or that we can wait till another time. Uh, Susan for finance. I think I'm good. Uh, Helen for capital. We had a good peer school community meeting. Okay. Uh, Barbara for curriculum. We have another meeting on Monday, May 11th. Uh, we will be hearing from, <clears throat> uh, we will be hearing about the math program review, the curriculum selection for K to five. We will be talking about the school site councils and uh, we will we'll be talking about summer programming. Okay. That's it. All right, uh, Helen for government relations. No. Um, Michael, anything else out of policy? No, but you'll need to appoint a chair. Uh, is there another meeting that's scheduled for May? No. Oh, that's good. All right. Um, interim superintendent search process. There's a, there's a oh, May actually, 11th meeting. Actually. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. There is a, there's not one scheduled for me. Yeah, uh, not for but, Michael. Uh, there, there is one, there is one scheduled. I forgot about that. There is one scheduled for May 18. I forget the date. Thank you, Jen. Okay. Monday, May 11th, right after curriculum is the next fine, uh, next policy. All right, Helen, for the interim superintendent search. 
Uh, we're continuing to interview and we will be meeting on Monday at 3.30. Okay. Executive session. All right, any other additional liaisons or updates? Uh, I hate to do this, but EDCO, I think I've told you in the past, there's a deficit there this year. This is all adding on to, um, and they're, I think they voted. I'm not sure if you got a number yet, Mary Ellen, um, from them. It's less than what I said, and right now I don't even have it in front of me, so I will bring it back to us the next meeting. Um, Helen, the last I had heard was that was expected somewhere around 75,000. It's less. It's less. It's gone down, and they're looking to just pay off the deficit and not the line of credit. And I, I want to say it's like uh, $24,630. And Mary Ellen, is that something that's something we'd have to pay this year? So, um, that I think would have to come out of this year. Um, but let's talk about it and figure out where. And so, Helen, yeah, you can just coordinate to make sure if that is, it can get on that sheet that we're we're using of COVID expenses because that's clearly on that. Yeah, that's an unexpected expense. Mm -hmm. Not a COVID expense. Oh, it's not COVID. It's not really. I, oh, okay. I thought it was. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Not all around. But right. there's savings because I had more in my estimate for that than we're paying out. So. Okay, great. Glad to hear that it was already somewhere. Uh, so then we have new business. Any new business? Oh, I do want us to start thinking about what's going to happen this summer and what's going to happen next year in terms of education. And I think that has to happen sooner rather than later. And I would hope that maybe the task force would start to think about it, or maybe you have already. Um, I'm willing to work on that one. Um, but I think we need to start thinking outside the box, working with the union and teachers and staff to, to figure out where things are going and also finding out what other systems are doing, what other school districts are doing. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Susan, is Sharon here yet? No, Susan, so is that something, if you could discuss that tomorrow at the task force meeting to see if that appropriately falls there. Another logical place for that conversation to start um, would be at curriculum. Ms. Barbara, yep. I'm not sure if you have time at the meeting on the 11th, but it seems like that might be an appropriate place. You're on mute, Barbara. Barbara, you're on mute. No, you're still on mute. Barbara, you're... we can't hear you. Yep. Oh. <laughs> Barbara. <laughs> Barbara, Barbara, we still can't hear you. It keeps going back. There you go. There you go. I can hear you now. It keeps going back. Now we can hear you. One of the things we're discussing. Yeah. One of the things we're discussing is the programming for the summer. Um, which you had mentioned is one of the things you talked about. That's already on the agenda. Okay, great. Then, uh, so thank you, Helen, for that. Any other new business? All right, so we have um, an executive session. We have a motion to meet in executive session pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A. Section 21A for the following purposes. Purpose two, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, non-aligned personnel. Purpose seven, to review and approve executive session minutes from the following meetings, September 26, 2019, October 2nd, October 10th, November 4th, December 12th, all of 2019, January 30th of 2020, February 13th and April 16th, 2020. For which we roll call again. Uh, Mr. Glover? Yes. Ms. Gata? Yes. Ms. Charlotsky? Yes. Ms. Wolf Ditka? Yes. Mr. Perlman? Yes. Ms. Monopoly? Yes. Ms. Fetterfield? Yes. And the chair votes yes as well. And uh, we may be returning into open session. Uh, Robin? 
how or do we have anyone participating yes we'll have to take a minute before we go to executive session for us to 